Welcome to Capital HQ, where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows await you. Dive into a world of possibilities, from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? Joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment. Hi, and welcome to the Capital HQ Investment Showcase. My name is Steve Torsa. I'm the founder of Polestyle Investor and Capital HQ. Today, we have an exciting lineup. This will actually be the first of many investment conferences we'll be hosting online, and it's an important step for us as a company. So to celebrate, we've actually got two keynotes. One is going to be from me. I'll be at the end of the session. The second one will be from renowned investor Steve Baxter. Now, many of you may know him from his time on Shark Tank. You know, he's one of the most prolific angel investors in this company, in sorry, in this country, and he's had some incredible uh, success with some of his portfolio companies. But he's also a business builder himself. His first deal was actually himself that he actually built and sold a built company, listed on the ASX, and then also sold it to, to TPG. Uh, he's also one of the the biggest uh, syndicate leads in the country as well via 1013. And then recently he launched his own fund called the Beaten Zone Ventures, which is focused on defense tech. And if we think about everything that's happening in the world right now, that's quite a timely uh, quite a timely uh, fund to, to be releasing and in a very niche area, but obviously a significant opportunity. And the other thing we'll be doing is we'll be featuring a range of different companies, whether it be from startups to scale-ups, credit opportunities, property opportunities, etc., as part of our feature today. One of the most beautiful things about Capital HQ and WI is we get access to a range of companies. From an investor standpoint, this is one of the most exciting periods that I have seen for investors to get access to yield and also to growth opportunities. And you'll see that throughout the actual investment showcase. So you know, you're going to hear from a range of different uh, companies in, from a range of sectors at various different stages. And the way we've set this up is you're likely watching this inside the Capital HQ platform. We have made it super easy for you to connect directly with investors inside the actual platform to the point that said, obviously with the companies, you can look in the exhibitors area and you see all the different companies featured. If you've got certain sectors, you can filter the sectors or keywords, etc., to make it easy for you. Then also you've got a networking zone where it's got all the other investor attendees that are joining the event and obviously industry related, related people as well, where you can actually connect with each other. So during the session, you got two, I'd say there's three key areas to focus on during the session. Number one, focus on the companies which are of interest to you. We've got an agenda that you can see and you know, so you can see which presentations you want to watch. Focus on the companies that are interested to you. You can connect directly with those companies, request access to their deal room so you can access their information. They will obviously accept you. They'll let you in and you can have a look at the information of companies which are of interest to you. Likewise, you can connect with the CEOs directly inside the actual networking zone, right? So just make sure you select that you also want to connect with the exhibitors. So that way you can chat with the, the CEOs directly and then move that conversation offline uh, as well, like start with it online, then also move it to, to offline. And then sort of following it, following the actual session, you can also go and experience the, 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 I suppose, the real experience we want you to, not just the conference aspect, but then also on the platform side, where you can access the other opportunities that are featured inside Capital HQ. Now, you'll get, when you click on the opportunities tab, you'll see recommended for you. They're all, basically, that's, a, that's our AI and ML showing you the most relevant deals for you. It starts out with a preference matching, and then over time, it starts to learn what's of interest to you from a deals perspective. So everything we think about is how to streamline and simplify the way in which both sides, both you as a founder or you as an investor, can actually connect with what you're looking for. So, you know, if you've got any feedback for us on the experience or ways we can improve so forth, we always recommend that as well. 
This is just the first step for us. We're gonna be looking to host these investment showcases every two months. We wanna make sure that we continue building a global audience of investors and also companies coming on board because I said everything we do is about creating opportunities for tomorrow. Everything we think about is about empowering innovation, capital, and ambition. So the Capital HQ Online Investment Showcase stands fundamental to that mission going forward. I hope you enjoyed today's session and I'll see you for my keynote at the end. Hello, please take note. This presentation is meant for people who qualify as wholesale investors under the Corporations Act. Would you like access to an asset class with a total addressable market of 1.2 trillion US, growing to 1.9 trillion US over the next few short years? My name is Steve Baxter, and this is Beaton's Own Venture Partners Fund Number One. You will all be aware of the global insecurity present in the news every day. If it is not the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's the ever present but escalating confrontations in the Middle East. We recently experienced the mass supply chain issues around COVID and have now seen the extents of globalised world trade. It seems when things go wrong, countries will look after themselves first. Defence technology spending has been exceptionally inefficient over the last 20 years. Despite this, there has been some amazing products rise to the surface. Previously, most defence technology innovation was funded via non-dilutive Defence Department grants, was besieged by limited funding and wrought by perceptions of ESG. Other than the funding from founders, family and friends, there's been very little early stage equity in defence technology. Beaton Zone is a first mover. As an investor, my job is to buy low and sell high. As such, we're always on the lookout for assets where other investors fear to tread, where, for whatever reason, they do not attract the flood of capital that sees values bid too high. Beaton Zone is about businesses in the lethality and survivability area of defence technology, where lethality means investing in things that soldiers, sailors and airmen need to do their ultimate job. Not that we ever want that to happen. And survivability is about the things that allow the allied forces to withstand the opposition's lethality. We do this because very few other investors will consider an opportunity in this sphere, where the perception of the capability it brings drives investors away. So we are raising an ESVCLP fund, and we are conditionally approved to invest in sovereign Australian defence technology that has applicability in the allied market, that being the $1.2 trillion and growing market, not the $32 billion Australian market. Being ESVCLP, we can also invest up to 20% in non-sovereign opportunities, and we're deploying capital to ensure the best strategic outcome for the beaten zone portfolio. The businesses we invest in need to have a material military application. Our view is that these opportunities have a discount applied to their valuation due to their inherent lethality, and that over time, as the technology in them widens to have more civil appeal, this discount for lethality will diminish, thereby increasing the return for the fund. I'm the lead investor and CEO, and have a background investing in early stage technology businesses in Australia. My track record to date has returned 29% cash on cash to my family. Examples of the businesses and exits I've achieved are represented here. Please feel free to pause and go through them. I started this journey over a year ago and built an amazing team, including two analysts and a deal scout. I've also a great set of advisors along to assist. These people range from ex-special forces operators to aerospace engineers and production experts as well. The Australian defence budget in US dollar terms is $32 billion. We are chasing an allied market worth $1.2 trillion, growing to $1.9 trillion. The allied market is NATO, AUKUS, Five Eyes, the Quad, and other friendly, sometimes non-aligned nations. The world is currently racing to close many technology and production gaps, where recent conflicts have delivered exposure thanks to rapid combat innovation. The spending on innovation across the Allied sphere is growing. Overseas, DARPA and DONA are well-funded. In Australia, the Advanced Strategic Capabilities Accelerator, the Guided Weapons and Explosive Ordnance Enterprise, and even the National Reconstruction Fund all have allocations for defence technology. Beaton Zone is a first mover. 
We will fund things that most other investors and no structured fund dare goes near. Less investors at the table means better valuations. Culminating with the depressed macro environment for tech startup investing, the confounding factor of AI rapidly changing the business landscape. This allows for a greater counter-cyclical approach with a capital allocation to the defence technology asset class. There are many tailwinds that are propping up this sector and seeing expenditures grow. The Middle East and Ukraine conflict and other tensions in the regions. The ever-present threat of China miscalculating over Taiwan. The AUKUS program will spend $330 billion on submarines and a further $40 billion on other advanced military technologies. This will lead to an influx of talent and people into the sector that will provide a wellspring of future entrepreneurs. If Australia is to operate and build US nuclear submarines, then the current restrictive practices of ITAR, which limits how and who can work on US-centric defence tech, will be and is in the process of being liberalised between the AUKUS nations. This is a good thing and will lead to many efficiencies. We are raising a $60 million fund with a first close at $10 million. We are targeting a 20% IRR given historical M&A, whilst noting that the recent influx of, influx of venture capital into this sector in the US is seeing M&A move from PE-led to more speculative venture-led activity. We will be investing in rounds between seed and good value series A. We invest in companies with immediate applicability to the allied market. As for portfolio construction, there are five domains in defence, sea, air, land, space and cyber. We also view our pipeline through the lens of software and hardware, given the different return profiles of those verticals. For the most part, we will invest across all domains, but given how dual use the cyber domain is, we're not actively scouting for deals in this area, but would not not do a deal if one presented. For the most part, valuations in this area are too high for our thesis. It is worth noting that electronic warfare is not the cyber domain. We are hard at work. We have been networked well into the Australian defence innovation scene for some time and have active and an active pipeline of opportunities. We are a first-in-class funder with no ESG hang-ups. We are across the entire defence technology landscape through deep relationships and networks. We have assembled a great team with decades of experience conducting early stage investments, and we are not waiting. Despite not reaching first close, we have warehoused two deals. One in the space sector, HR Robotics, a company that allows the imaging of spacecraft from other spacecraft. Based out of Sydney, Will and HJ have built an amazing business. We have co-invested alongside Inkytel, which is the Central Intelligence Agency's venture fund, as well as Airtree and other local investors. Our second deal, Arcus, a cutting edge sensor company out of Melbourne, building sensors for the littoral, that is the junction between the, the sea and the land uh, and the naval space. We are established with a somewhat standard venture fee model with a two and 20 on an 8% hurdle. We have a published minimum subscription of 350,000 Australian, but at the discretion of the manager, we will and have accepted less. I am lead investor. I am contributing 6 million in line with the ES VCLP rules regarding max LP contribution. That is no more than 30% at any time of committed capital. So all my contribution will be in from the first close that occurs greater than 20 million. We would love to see you come on board for this excellent opportunity to access the defense asset class. There is a link here if you want to sign right up. We'd love to have you. I also look forward to taking any questions at investor at beatonzone.vc. Thanks for your time. Thanks for joining the Capital HQ Investment Showcase. Our first presenter is Richard Palmer, partner at Horizon 2 Capital. Horizon 2 Capital's bold investment strategy is shaping the future of manufacturing. Welcome, Richard. Hello everyone, my name is Richard Palmer. I'm a partner at Horizon 2 Capital Partners. Uh, we're a private equity business based in Australia and we invest into businesses that make complex things. We have a track record of over 15 years uh, uh, making these types of investments and it's my pleasure to talk to you today about Grabber Technologies, uh, which is the second investment that we've made in the last 
uh, 24 months. The good news is that we settled the first tranche of this investment. We are raising $10 million and we settled the first $5 million on Friday last week with a range of investors, including shareholders in Gravit Technologies. What I'd like to talk to you today about is the business itself and the balance of the capital that we're seeking to raise another $5 million in the next three to four months. As I indicated, we're raising $10 million worth of preferred stock for Grabber Technologies. Grabber is a global business that produces biometric devices for global customers in the North American, European, and Asian markets. It's a firm that is doing close to $20 million worth of Australian revenue per annum, and it will do in this financial year between three and a half and $4 million worth of profit. It's highly profitable, run very quickly, and is a growth business with cash flow. This is not a startup. The offer uh, that the company has accepted uh, is for Horizon 2 to raise $10 million. And as I indicated, we settled the first $5 million into the business on Friday of last week. Uh, the $10 million is going to purchase just over 28% of the business. So turning to the deal itself, as I indicated, uh, Gravit Technologies is a well-established business that sells to tier one global customers biometric handheld devices. If you think about the uh, biometric devices you've seen, it would be typically in static environments, at airports and perhaps uh, in streets. Gravit Technology develops the same technology, but these are mobile. So its use case is where its clients need biometric identification technology at point of sale or in the field. And their major customers are border security organizations, police forces, and humanitarian agencies, all who need biometric devices out in the marketplace, uh, out on the field. But also they sell to commercial enterprises that require uh, their customers when they're purchasing an item uh, to be validated, typically a know they, know they customer uh, type scenario. As I indicated, this is a well-established business with $60 million worth of sales in its pipeline. It's uh, got orders of over $14 million uh, currently. It has a, it's a global operation. Its head office is court, headquartered in Brisbane uh, in Australia. It's got sales offices in the United Arab Emirates and in the US. Uh, and the capital that is being uh, raised is to extend the sales and marketing capability that the firm has in the UAE and the USA. With the first tranche of investment in the business is taken in the $5 million, uh, we are recruiting in the UAE, UAE at, the, at the moment. In addition to the core biometric business, uh, it also uh, has a microelectronics business, which has sovereign capability. And to that end, it is a supplier in Australia to a range of uh, national and international defence and aerospace players and has customers of the York of Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, and the Australian Defence Force. In terms of the deal, uh, we have negotiated a range of downside protection risks for investors. Uh, in other words, uh, Whilst we believe that this business uh, is going to grow very successfully and has a real opportunity to scale and make a very substantial return for its investors, uh, there is solid downside protection risk for investors. Uh, we have a liquidity preference, which ensures that we will get one times our money back if the business doesn't hit its targets. And we have a, ma a mandatory sale uh, opportunity in the next eight years. Whilst not the plan, this investment uh, does have downside capital protection risks, which we've quickly negotiated for our investors. As I indicated, the business itself has two divisions. The first is Grabber, which creates the biometric devices. The second is Crystal Lake Manufacture, which is the uh, microelectronics business itself. The core Grabber business has currently over 15,000 devices in the global market. And the business plan which we've invested in is to essentially double that over the next three years. Likewise, with the Crystal Bay manufacturing business is to take its uh, capabilities and start to sell this into the international and the domestic markets. Uh, 
the growth of this business is well underway and we're seeing very strong uptake in both the grabber business and the crystal aid manufacturing business for the uh for the business plan which we are pleased to say looks like is going to be met over the next 24 to 36 months these are some of the products that uh grabber sells these are handheld diametric devices that allow the user to do everything from uh, biometric uh, authentication, fingerprint, iris, uh, facial recognition, but also to scan the user's credit card, ID or passport code. These are robust units that are used in the field by customers like uh, um, Homeland Security in the US, the Home Department in um, Home Office in the UK, and a range of high profile uh, customers in border, border protection and security. It's also being used by the UN and uh, states which require uh, refugees to be understood and, and uh, identified. Crystal Aid itself, as I say, is, is largely a PCB manufacturer, so it makes complex circuit boards. Its key differentiation is that it is defense and aerospace uh, certified. And this has been recognized by a range of uh, tier one uh, primes around the world who are looking for it to produce, uh, to be part of its supply chain and produce high quality uh, defense and aerospace re uh, related products. Crystal Aid's core customer is Grabber itself and it produces all the complex electronics required in the devices that Grabber creates. As I indicated before, the business has global coverage based in Australia with sales offices in the UAE and the US and has significant customers, significant customers in Europe. It has global customers, tier one, over 48% of the customer base currently is in the UAE, uh, with the, the next major uh, portion being Australia and North America. The business plan that we are investing in and has currently been executed uh, is all about driving revenue and growth into a range of key markets, uh, in particular the Saudi and Oman market, um, and the goal here is to generate an additional 15 to 20 million dollars worth of annual revenue, uh, building on the success that it's had in the UAE. We've got strong customer support from our UAE customers who also operate in Oman and Saudi Arabia, and this is specifically the major telecom communication players in those markets and a range of uh, tier one banks that are using the product in those markets today. In terms of the core grabber product and border protection and security. The goal is essentially to grow its market share in the US and Canada, in particular with key defense forces. And we're currently talking to a range of tier one uh, police uh, and local uh, police departments in the US. Last but not least, the goal is to grow its capability and its defense contracts in the uh, Australian and global markets. Turning to the future, and we're currently working on this, but the future for biometric authentication is remote authentication. And this is essentially technology that will allow, allow a border security officer uh, or somebody in a remote environment to use a combination of AI, machine learning, and drone technology to be able to undertake the biometric scans that are currently used, um, they currently use with a physical device. We are currently working on this with our customer base in the US in particular, and this technology will be released in the next 24 months. This is the future of the business going forward. Just wrapping up, as I said earlier, uh, we are raising $10 million for just over 28% of the company. We finalized the first $5 million last week, and we're seeking another uh, $5 million to close this round to support the efforts uh, of the existing shareholders and the, and the investors that have currently um, come in. Uh, this is the business has a pre-money valuation of $25 million, a post-money valuation of 35, and that's a multiple of EBITDA just over five and a half. We look forward to talking to any investors that are interested in this opportunity. Thank you very much for your time. Our next presenter is Esther O, oh, CEO at Ajili 8. Ajili 8 is a multiple award-winning X-ray vision enabling remote healthcare, mission-critical operations, and 3D immersive training. 
Have you ever lost a loved one because the right medical expertise was not there at the most critical moment? I lost my son's vision as a result of delayed treatment due to the expertise gaps during COVID lockdown. It was the fourth professor who told us 18 months later that his eyesight could have been saved if the first doctor sent him to emergency for 20 minutes sterile infusion instead of referring us from specialist to specialist. I also have doctor friends who died from COVID trying to save people's lives. That's why Agiliad is so purpose-driven to save lives, protect the clinicians, and transform the way that we deliver virtual care. Hi, my name is Esther O. I'm the CEO of Agiliad, an adjective meaning empower to work smarter, faster, and safer. The problem of adverse events that I've described is huge. On the demand side, we have long waiting times, long travel and distances and cost, which makes healthcare inaccessible for many patients, especially when the specialists don't live near where you are. This affects more than 134 million patients globally every year, which means an astounding 4 in 10 patients are harmed. In the US alone, it costs $950 billion, which accounts for 40% of the total healthcare spend. But 80% of such deaths and disabilities are actually preventable. On the supply side, we have overworked clinicians which are prone to making mistakes, such as misdosing, misdiagnosis, and delays from fatigue, stress, and lack of expertise. And we have a huge brain drain in this sector post-COVID. In fact, this global crisis of increasing aging population, disasters and pandemics, with this increasing demand from patients but decreasing supply of clinicians, indicates an 18 million shortfall of clinicians by 2030. What does that mean? It means that you and I will not be able to get timely treatment when we most need it. Using a bottoms-up approach, Agiliate has a serviceable, obtainable market of $22 million in annual recurring revenue just in Western Australia alone. This is equivalent to capturing 10% of the 9,210 air and land ambulances in Australia or 10% of the healthcare workforce in just one of our customers. W alone has the biggest health service provider in the Southern Hemisphere. For instance, one of our customers, the WA Country Health Service, serves more than half a million people across 2.5 square kilometres of desert, with 295 hospitals, clinics and nursing posts. Our SAM, based on selling nationwide, will in, in Australia could reach $100 million with a total addressable market of a $1 billion worldwide. Our solution integrates extended reality and artificial intelligence with computer vision into a one-click solution called X-ray vision. It empowers frontliners by connecting them to experts and AI assistants by delivering knowledge on demand in real time, hands-free on smart glasses. We can also do it on smartphones, which enables the patients to have remote patient monitoring with the power of their phone in their hands. So what we've got is that we built the platform in modules. And the first module, Remote Collaboration, allows the off-site specialists to zoom, draw, highlight, and share information with their 3D hands in merged reality coming out through the smart glasses on the patient's wound itself to give precise instructions. Module 2, AI Assistance, is a fallback when there's no human or internet available allowing frontliners to do voice command, to retrieve digital checklists, procedures, and decision trees to show them step-by-step -step instructions to prevent adverse events from happening due to lack of knowledge and experience. We are also building AI recognition, whereby it will help the frontliner to decipher uh, between the picture on the left, which is a COVID toll, versus the picture on the right, which is a diabetic toll. So that AI recognition will help to enable faster triage before the frontliner contacts the specialist. Our value proposition can be demonstrated in a post trachotomy case, which took seven manpower, $25,000 to, 
to fly the doctor to the remote hospital via the Royal Flying Doctor Service. In Albany, 15 hours of lost time and 400 kilograms of car- and 300 kilograms of carbon footprint. Whereas our solution only requires two staff, 50 cents, five minutes, with no carbon footprint or logistic hassle at all. If you look at our uniqueness, we not only invented um, innovation in the technology space, but we also reinvented the business model of how we operate. So instead of expensive CAPEX, whereby the health service providers have to buy a lot of equipment that they have to maintain and they have to service, we basically make it a very easy and economic OPEX model where they pay a monthly subscription, which is bundled with the smart glasses and the platform itself. So Agilite has also stress tested our technology in some of the most harshest conditions under 45 to 50 degrees heat in the Western desert of Australia. We also have the ability whereby you have multi-modalities um, where the expert can actually send a URL to the patient uh, who might be far away to be able to enter into this virtual immersive room uh, to do their consults, even if they don't have a front liner with the smart glasses on. So basically, this one-click URL does not require the patient to even download an app. So for one of our biggest competitor, Proximy, they have raised over 130 million US dollars um, over three rounds from only 16 investors. This shows that there is a huge demand for this kind of uh, visualization and 3D merge reality technologies in the medical space. So in terms of traction, we basically have doubled our revenue year on year and we have won multiple state, national and global awards in artificial intelligence, healthcare, technology leadership and cybersecurity. Our 1.3 million pre-seed raise was led by Aramsi Ventures in Singapore with many well-known medtech, finance and deep tech professors on our cap table. So as you can see, we have also been funded by the Australian government as well as the state government um, to conduct many of our paid pilots. And these are some of the customers and partners you can see on this slide. In terms of our roadmap, we aligned technology, sales and marketing with our IP strategies. And uh, this is the purple line shows where we are at the moment whereby we are conducting all these paid pilots to refine our solutions and collect clinical evidence. Uh, We are selling direct to health service providers, including the private sector, public sector, as well as the not-for-profit healthcare providers. We have three Australian patents, of which one we have submitted for international PCT pending the country's selection. And we are implementing the ISO 9001 and 27001 to in order for us to get into the government um, supply chains. So in terms of our business model, we operate as a modular sales platform and we will continue innovating the different modules to upsell to our clients. And we have already validated the product market fit with paying customers at the price that we have stipulated. Um, the long term, the, the life um, lifetime value of our customers, because a lot of them are actually government hospitals, so we have a very sticky um, customer base with renewable five to seven year government contracts. And as I said, you know, just securing 10% of the air and land ambulances in uh, Western Australia will give us the annual recurring revenue of $22 million in five years time. And that is equivalent to about 961 subscribers. So in terms of our use of funds, it's really basically to um, accelerate our sales, to generate more revenue and to protect and our IP as well. Um, as I said, we've got three Australian patents. We've only filed uh, one because of the cost of um, each patent. Um, so part of the cap race is to help us to launch the other two. And uh, one of the key uh, use of funds is obviously also for getting the certifications that we need to become a preferred vendor in the government supply chain. So why Agiliate? 
Well, basically, it can be summarized in three T's. Timing, technology, and team. So the timing is now, as you can see, that there's a lot of even large camp companies like um, Apple and Samsung. Um, they're all going into this augmented reality or extended reality space and putting lots of investment into it. And this is going to be a determinant of the future of work, whereby the virtual workforce will be able to collaborate in a very immersive environment where the hands of the remote expert could come into the vision of a frontliner who might be thousands of kilometers away. Um, our technology has the patents that uh, have been protected and uh, we also have trade secrets that we do not reveal through the patents. And our team is made up of both clinical, financial and commercial and technology experts who have a consistent track record of success throughout their careers. So I urge you to join our mission and really make a difference to the lives of many patients and prevent all these adverse events from happening. You know, we are also um, a Medical Research Future Fund eligible organizations, which is a status more, mostly held by large hospitals, uh, medical centers, and universities in the past, where we can access multi million dollars Commonwealth funding for medical research. We are also an early stage innovation company recognized by the ATO so that the, uh, any um, investors who come in before the 30th of June this year will be able to get 100% capital gains tax-free for 10 years and 20% tax offset within the next five years. So this is an opportunity for you to invest in a profit with purpose business that is highly disruptive profitable and scalable with the tax incentive to um, you as an investor as well. After this date, we will not be able to provide these tax incentives anymore because the Australian Tax Office deemed that our revenue is too high to be considered as an early stage. So for any um, tax inquiries, we encourage you to consult an Australian early stage innovation company accountant. And if you need help, please feel free to contact me with my details here. Thank you. Our next presenter is Jackie Bloom, Growth and Investment Director at Startup Bootcamp. They are number one accelerator in the world outside of the US. They operate in 27 countries around the globe has accelerated over 1,600 plus startups. Full disclaimer that this presentation and the information I'm sharing with you is not intended to be financial advice, but you are, however, welcome to invest. So welcome to Startup Bootcamp. We were founded by Ruth Hendricks and Patrick Dezou in 2010 and are now proudly one of the world's largest industry focused accelerators. In fact, just recently, we were announced as the number one accelerator in Europe and number three in the world. To date, we've invested in over 1,700 startups. 76% of those remain active four years post-program, a number we are particularly proud of, and 41% of them are female-led. 72% have gone on to raise follow-on funding. We currently operate across 27 countries globally. We are backed by a robust network of over 300 co-investors and additional 2,000 angels and VCs, boasting an impressive 5,000 mentor experts and partners. And most importantly, we proudly nurture a truly global community comprising of over 100,000 members. Our global vision is audacious, and we believe that innovation will revolutionise the world. At Startup Bootcamp, this translates to accelerating and investing in 100,000 startups to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Recognising sustainability and fintech as pivotal industries shaping our future, we've introduced the Sustainable Fintech Fund as part of our strategy to maximise our global impact. The Sustainable Fintech Fund is a $5 million Australian dollar fund that will invest into 30 early stage startups over the next two years. Three cohorts with 10 startups in each. The first cohort of 10 startups 
has just completed the program and I'm thrilled to announce that they will be presenting their demo day at Money 2020 Asia in Bangkok at the end of April. So how do we do it? Well, to uncover the most promising startups, we cast our net worldwide. Our dedicated in-house scouting team meticulously evaluates up to 40,000 startups for each program. Utilising our proprietary software, we assess them through a rigorous process of elimination, due diligence and interviews. As we narrow down the top 60, we categorise them based on themes and share insights with our investors. Upon reaching the final 20, we then conduct formal selection days. Investors in the fund are inviting are invited to attend these sessions where they can witness pitches and offer feedback to our investment committee, ensuring a hands-on approach to their investment. When selecting startups to join our program, we prioritise three key criteria. Firstly, we assess the strength and cohesion of the team, ensuring it's well-established. Secondly, we evaluate traction. Startups should have progressed beyond the ideation stage, undergoing validation processes to really confirm the viability of their ideas. While revenue generation and MVP development are not mandatory, they should certainly be on the path towards achieving these milestones. And lastly, we scrutinise the market opportunity. It's really essential that the market size and potential for growth align with the requirements for venture capital backing, enabling startups to pursue exits or secure follow-on funding. When operating our accelerator program, we prioritise three fundamental areas to ensure the success of the startups. Firstly, we emphasise pitch readiness, guiding founders in crafting compelling and effective pitches that succinctly communicate their vision, progress and potential impact. Secondly, we place significant emphasis on commercial readiness, assisting startups engaging their technology's readiness for commercialisation and helping them navigate the path to market entry. And lastly, we focus on investment readiness, really providing startups with the tools and knowledge necessary to attract investor interest and secure funding. And so by addressing these three key areas comprehensively, we aim to maximise the potential for success whilst de-risking the investment. We also invite mentors onto the program and our investors are often our mentors in the program where they have value-add skill sets or industry knowledge to be able to add um, to our program as well. So it really can be a hands-on investment if you choose so, or it can be passive. Our fun team comprises of Trevor Townsend, Richard Selm, and myself, Jackie Bloom. Combining our experience, we embody a diverse range of skills and expertise, crucial for driving innovation and fostering entrepreneurial success. With extensive backgrounds and knowledge in business, technology, and finance, our team brings strategic insights and a passion for supporting startups through investment and mentorship. Between us, we have over 80 years of experience combined. At Startup Bootcamp, we employ four distinct strategies to ensure the success of your investments. Firstly, our access to global deals allows us to tap into diverse investment opportunities worldwide providing access to emerging markets and promising ventures. Secondly, our unique scouting process enables us to identify high potential investments early on. Thirdly, our de-risk acceleration program provides support and guidance to startups, minimising risk and maximising potential return. A proven program operating for 14 years. And lastly, we prioritise portfolio diversification and future investment allocation ensuring a balanced and resilient investment portfolio. So by integrating these four approaches, we aim to optimise your investment outcomes and achieve long-term success. Since 2018, we've progressively been building the Australian fintech portfolio, which currently consists of 37 investments and a net perceived value of 25 mil. And that portfolio will continue to grow with this fund and another 20 investments to come. 
Internationally, our portfolios have seen a remarkable achievements, including significant exits such as Relia realising 420 mil AUD, SendCloud at 900 mil AUD, and Cuda Bank currently sitting on a $1 billion valuation. And it doesn't stop there. Over the past decade, our funds have yielded an average seven average return of 7.4 times globally, with even greater future success anticipated. So the offer we're presenting is a truly unique opportunity to invest into this alternative asset class. Diversify a portfolio across 30 early stage sustainable fintech startups with first rights for follow on allocation. The average check size starts at 100K, will be invested over a seven year period and is targeting a conservative 3.3 times multiple. And I should mention the investment is, a, is in Australian dollars. Thank you so much for your time. Please reach out with any questions. And remember, it's not a question of whether you can afford to invest, but certainly a question of whether you can afford not to. Don't miss this opportunity. Thanks. Our next presenter is Dr. John Bishop, Executive Chair at Direct Lithium, PTYLTD. Direct Lithium is working to extract lithium and generate renewable 24-7 dispatchable power from a large geothermal resource in eastern Tasmania. Hi, my name is John Bishop and I'm going to talk about the exciting Lamont Geolithium project in eastern Tasmania. When uh, up and operating, this project is going to produce reliable, renewable, dispatchable electricity from hot geothermal brines in the subsurface. And it's also going to produce a high purity battery grade lithium extracted from the brine prior to its reinjection. Why is it exciting? Now's the time you can see from the top image that the dispatchable uh, baseload generators that we've got from coal and gas are uh, being closed fairly rapidly uh, and we'll be lots left with largely intermittent uh, variable generators. Geothermal's perhaps the only renewable that's capable of producing dispatchable electricity at scale. Uh, and it's also as a synchronous generator able to act as a, a stabilizer for the for the grid so it's a very um, desirable form of electricity we, we are going to need storage associated with wind and solar and lithium as the most electrically chemically active element in the periodic table is it gives you the most bang for your buck in terms of storage and from the bottom image, you can see we're just on the cusp of this large forecast demand for lithium uh, and wondering where the extra supply is going to come from. But let's let's have a look a bit deeper at geothermal power. That's there is none currently, no commercial geothermal power in Australia. Um, but there's no reason why there shouldn't be. There's been some pretty significant breakthroughs in geothermal. Uh, in the last few years, we're getting very much closer to having geothermal power producing electricity where it's wanted. The Earth's a, an enormous heat bank uh, with a storage life of billions of years, and it's an in, effectively an inexhaustible supply of, for our energy requirements. There's currently 27 countries with 600 odd geothermal power plants producing power 24-7, and that's set to increase um, considerably. There's a number of other attributes to geothermal, not the least of which is its its uh, footprint. It's got the smallest footprint of all geothermal gener of all generators, uh, and it's got the, the uh, one of the highest capacity factors. It's, uh, <clears throat> if you've got 100 megawatts of power station, if it's a solar power station, you'll get 20 to 30 megawatts. If it's a geothermal power station, you're going to get 80 to 90 megawatts. 
Um, turning to lithium mining, roughly half the world's lithium comes from shallow uh, salars in South America. Uh, this is brine just close to the surface. It gets pumped up to the uh, onto the surface where it evaporates, and you're left with a, a lithium salt. Uh, and the other half is hard rock conventional mining, most of it in Australia, and that produces a concentrate five to six percent, and that gets currently most of that goes to, to China for for processing. We're going to talk about DLE, direct lithium extraction, which has been around for twenty odd years, and it produces currently produces 10% of the world's lithium, and it can be used on any brine, and it, it is being <clears throat> pardon me, increasingly used for solars. Chile's got a, a stated policy of switching from solar evaporation to, to DLE and getting twice the recovery and a, and a higher grade, more pure product. If we look at this, here's the current uh, DLE project which I've split up into geothermal brines, oil field brines, and, and solars. Uh, and in the bottom right, that diagram there shows how DLE compares to solar evaporation uh, or to hard rock. So you get twice the recovery from DLE. You get no water usage or wastage, uh, zero or near zero CO2 emissions, and again, a very small footprint. So it's a it's a low impact, sustainable process, uh, and it's forecast to, to come up to about thirty percent of the increased uh, production of uh, of lithium. And there's the the <clears throat> range of grades that you're getting for those three types of of brines, and the target range for Vermont. Turning now to to, to Tasmania, Tasmania is a got a long history of mining and uh, energy. It's got a pretty much 100% of its power comes from hydroelectricity, but it's getting increasingly uh, wind and solar, and it's got a stated policy to become Australia's renewable energy battery of the nation, which means it needs more renewable energy uh, and there's no more dams. So geothermal is going to help fill that gap. Uh, it's got a long history of metalliferous mining and regarded as a, as a tier one jurisdiction. The license includes the large, um, code compliant geothermal resource, Lamont, that was uh, defined by Cooth Energy, a company we floated, uh, 10 to 15 years ago. And, uh, that was a geothermal only. And it's the lithium that's, um, that's made a change as well as the, the recent breakthroughs in geothermal. The corporate structure, the direct lithium is a private company, um, mainly owned by my family interest at the moment, but others, including Shane Bartell, have come on board. And uh, Shane's a currently non-executive director, and we expect to appoint another one um, post uh, post investment. Uh, the point of the graphic there is to show the that we've got the Elements for this type of project are covered. There's the heat, it's the grade of lithium from outcropping uh, granites in the uh, in the northeast, and we've also got the flow, the permeability. Not evident there is. It's also we've got got the size. <clears throat> so the seeking to raise six million dollars from a pre-money eight million valuation. Most of that money is going, will go on a, a deep slimline hole, which will give us the parameters for a feasibility study, but it'll also give us the, uh, a maiden lithium resource that's anticipate that'll be a large resource and that will give us a significant uptick in valuation. And we can't wait to start. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Alan Rankins, CEO at Guardware. For over a decade, Guardware protected information assets worldwide, offering tailored solutions across sectors and now serving the defence industry with their products. Hello, and welcome to the most innovative and disruptive data security solution in the world. Our company, Guardware Australia, is a mere few months from reaching a marketable product that will eliminate 
data theft once and for all. My name is Alan Rankins and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Guardware Australia, a small but rapidly growing software house that has taken a completely different path to data protection. I lead a small but potent team of cyber and engineering experts and innovators who are data security experts. Our current products can analyse who is accessing data in your organisation and routinely advise you where it is going. That is pretty powerful in its own right. But after a decade of self-investment, Guardware is ready to disrupt the cyber security paradigm. The current norm is billions are spent building walls and vaults around data, which try to make it hard for bad actors from gaining access to that data. But the underlying data is still remains vulnerable. And all it takes is one small hole and all data is lost. The truth is this old method of building walls around data alone has failed. Breaches are increasingly exponentially difficult to solve and higher in impact. And it is now time to solve the problem at the source. And that is by focusing on securing the data itself in such a way that it makes it unhackable. And that is our solution. Gardner's unique approach to this problem is by controlling and protecting the data itself, all of the time using persistent encryption. As data is protected all of the time, it doesn't matter if it's stolen or hacked or maliciously copied by a trusted insider. Your data remains secure and you are in control all of the time. With Guardware, Medibank and Optus breaches to name two would not have been held to ransom as stolen data would have been unreadable. Right. And let me tell you, no other software has this total capability. All existing potential competitors either provide partial protection focused on some data or partial control or partial visibility. Guardware is the only solution that provides 100% visibility, 100% protection and 100% control all of the time. And it even works with large enterprise solutions such as SAP and on video files and all proprietary data formats. Imagine this scenario. I have a sensitive or classified file of any type, but let's say it is an industrial secret drawing CAD pad. With Gardware, I wrap the file with our unique encryption technology. And you may say, yes, but many others use encryption. However, there is more. My staff member takes a drawing out of that CAD file and the first surprise, it remains encrypted while the staff member is actually working on it. The staff member uploads the drawing to an email. Again, it remains encrypted. The staff member sends it to a competitor. It is still encrypted and the competitor doesn't have the key, so it will never open. The staff member tries to take a screenshot, but the image is blank. Finally, the file is sent to the manufacturer chosen to build the part. That supply chain member has the key, but only those you have authorised can open the file. By the way, you can see what is happening to that file all the way down the supply chain. And if you want to, turn off the key. It can be on a timer too. And by the way, again, Gardner's solution will also be quantum secure. Now think about that piece of data being your Medibank record. The hacker would have stolen it, as they did. But the data is fully protected. What about a sensitive nuclear submarine design file? A US company wants to transmit to an Australian or UK partner but is sceptical that appropriate and effective protection will be in place. Gardner data file protection can be monitored from any international location and turned on and off at will. How can you be sure this works? Well, we have the prototype done. Is it just us saying that this prototype does what we say? No, we have had the software independently reviewed by cyber experts from the University of New South Wales and CGI, the world's largest system integrator. Contact us and see for yourselves with a demo.
Gardware knows data security from an existing client base. We have a growing list of customers using our existing Gardware modules in various sectors from defence, manufacturing, education, finance, telcos, etc. All supported by a growing network of channel partners. Gardware is ready to disrupt the paradigm. This customer base will serve as the bedrock just as soon as the encryption model module is available and we will account for fast take up and growth. And you are truly looking at a global market. Every organisation on the planet will need Guardware because everyone has some form of data they want to secure. In five years, Guardware style solutions will become as synonymous as antivirus. Guardware will revolutionise supply chain security, IP sharing and all collaborative work. And there is a huge untapped market that is the small to medium enterprises that cannot afford the large firewalls. There are 1 million in Australia alone. Guardware is infinitely scalable and the only solution that is affordable to these SMEs. It is easy to use, transparent, and will solve the security challenges for the SMEs. Our extremely conservative estimates, accounting for only a few sectors in the UK, US, and Australia, place our five-year revenue at 178 million, just 5% of the accessible market. We are seeking $5 million capital to finish the development of our encryption product and supercharge our marketing. Our company has undertaken due diligence, legally and financially, and we are ready to go. We have the development pathway well mapped. Join us on this exciting journey of innovation, and let's beat both the outside hacker and the inside threat. Even Julian Assange would have been unknown if the US government had cardware. Thank you. Our next presenter is Alex Barnes, CEO at Lantern. Lantern is a leading B2B operations productivity software for car, bike and scooter fleets. Their AI-powered co-pilot schedules tasks for fleet technicians, boosting vehicle utilisation and service team efficiency. Hi, I'm Alex, the CEO and co-founder of Lantern. Lantern is a productivity platform that helps teams manage their workflow efficiently. So there are over 97 million connected vehicles today, and it's growing 20% year on year. We're seeing that cars, scooters, and bike fleets are now increasingly part of this connected vehicle pool. And we're also seeing a shift towards shared fleets, uh, not just personal owned vehicles, but shared fleets for like rental and short-term short -term lease. Okay, the problem though is that these operations, the fleet operations that underpin these um, companies is often like really inefficient and time consuming. There's lots of work that needs to be done like tire changing, uh, uh, recharging batteries, cleaning, maintenance, and it's really hard for teams to know what is the most important work that they should focus on. Um, they often use legacy shop software that doesn't really match um, their workflow. So like existing fleet management systems are really hard to use. They don't assign a work effectively and they don't track tasks to completion. And that means like the fleet manager has to sift through like with complicated alerts and call up fleet technicians and ask them where work is up to. They've got no way of tracking what's going on properly. And so what we do is we've created a software platform that makes it really easy for fleet teams to achieve their maximum productivity. Um, we read data from the vehicles, and then we use that to automatically create and schedule tasks. We assign them correctly to the technicians, and then we track them through to completion. And basically, we're guiding them to do the most important work, and we focus on a really great user experience. Um, and we also make it really flexible so that it suits the local conditions that the company's in. The benefits of that is that these vehicles get used more often. So we see that the vehicles get used up to 20% more and the technicians uh, get their work done quicker. 
up to 25% faster times uh, task time uh, saved per shift. And we've also got some powerful diagnostics. So the fleet manager can dig in and see if there are any bottlenecks in performance. So where we are today is we've got clients in the UK, the Nordics and Canada. Um, that's fleets of cars, scooters and bikes. Um, something we've got working on right now that's really exciting is a trial with Beryl, which is one of the leading UK bike share companies. And we're also in a consortium with Beryl to win the London bike share scheme, which would be a 10 year scheme optimizing 10,000 bikes, uh, which would be huge. Um, we're also building our sales and marketing motion. So we onboarded more sales and marketing support in January, and we're building out our partnerships with fleet management providers. I wanted to share with you what our customers think. Uh, this is a recent customer that we signed up. They said they love our analytics. Um, we automate their manual operations work uh, so that they can scale, uh, focus on scaling their fleet and their operations team is empowered to like find issues before they impact the clients. So, you know, how do we compare? Um, our, our, our real edge is on this user experience. We're continually focusing on refinements and we track how much value the users are getting using our custom metric valuable interactions per minute. Now, our competitors are mainly looking at API solutions where they will, they will feed an API um, they'll feed the tasks through an API to the end user, like the, the, the fleet company. We don't think that's as effective um, because it doesn't allow for that ability to iterate and keep refining the, the user experience. So our app does do that. We also have these performance diagnostics that are really powerful and we're competitively priced. So we start in the shared market, which is when people are using an app and they can easily book like a car or a bike or a scooter and then use it for a short trip. That's where we're starting. And that market is uh, 748 million pounds total by 2029. Then once we've saturated that market, we'll move into connected fleets. It's a wider, bigger market where the total um, size is 4.2 billion. And we operate a software as a service model. Uh, so it's all software and we charge a monthly fee per vehicle. And the way that we get the information is we take it from their um, existing fleet uh, asset management system and we read it directly from there. So there's no hardware component at all for us. Um, we use the vehicle standard data, such as mobility data specification to, um, to get the data that we need. And the way that we go to market is we, we have a couple of channels. We go direct outreach supported by the sales agency, as I mentioned earlier. Then we also get referrals in from fleet software partners and we exhibit at mobility industry events. So we sign deals at the last two events that we went to. And we've got a series of target partners that we want to sign up for this year to keep growing. So we keep a pretty low burn um, our goal is to get cash flow positive next year in Q3, and we we're looking to double or then later triple our revenue for the next five years until we're at 20, mil 20 million annual recurring. Uh, right now we're raising 200,000 pounds. We've already got 135,000 committed. We want to get to 50 customers and launch our advanced um, automation system. We're going to spend the money mainly on the sales and marketing and then uh, product and engineering. We want to scale to around 432,000 annual recurring by the end of the year and be in a position to close the seed round in 2025. So we've got an awesome team. So myself, I've got a background in consulting and um, I also in entrepreneurship won several awards at university at LSE in Oxford, and I've been leading the team for the last four years through our grant phase where we we're winning grants, now more into our commercial phase. Now we've got 
Sebastian is our head of technology and product. He's got this awesome background in data science, um, and he's also led product development the whole way through, um, through all of its iterations. Mia is our head of operations, and she has experience at a former, at a previous startup in spam filtering, which was acquired. She was in the same role, the head of operations. Codron is uh, our lead engineer, and he's ex Google, ex Amazon. Then we have awesome front end engineer in Eric, and our back end engineer is Adam. So our vision is to create radically efficient field operations for all of these fleet companies, and that's going to accelerate the transition to sustainable transport. Thanks very much for listening. Um, please get in touch with me if you're interested in participating in our round. Our next presenter is Andrew Balgani, Chief Strategy Officer at Trade Window. Trade Window is an NZX listed TWL software company that provides software solutions for exporters, importers, and freight forwarders. Their innovative approach is empowering global trade. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Balgani. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Trade Window. We're an NZX listed enterprise software company focused on simplifying how businesses conduct international trade. The Trade Window was founded in December 2018 by AJ Smith, our founder and CEO. The business was conceived in ASB Bank's innovation program. Trade Window is on a mission to eliminate paperwork and manual data entry uh, from international trade processes. So AJ and his team foresaw that the digitalization of trade processes could vastly reduce the administration burden and costs imposed on businesses, as well as streamline the exchange of data across an ecosystem of logistics providers, ports, banks, ocean carriers, insurance companies, border agencies, and more. Along with uh, his team, AJ developed Cube, uh, Trade Windows Super Connector platform. So Cube is an integrated global trade platform covering trade compliance, operations management, event tracking and visibility, data sharing and storage, as well as internal and external collaboration. So at Trade Window, we serve businesses what we call working on the front line of global trade. So this includes exporters, importers, otherwise known as shippers, uh, as well as we serve freight forwarders and customs brokers. I'll, I'll cover the customers in more detail shortly. So in a short space of time, we've grown to a team of 47. We're spread across Australia, New Zealand, uh, and the Philippines. Our team is a mix of international trade veterans who have deep knowledge in trade compliance processes. We also have subject matter experts with backgrounds covering freight forwarding, customs broking, law, finance, technology, all bring a different but relevant perspective on international trade. We're an accredited issuing body for certificates of origin. This is both in Australia and New Zealand. This means that we're one of only a handful of organisations accredited to issue certificates of origin on behalf of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia and the New Zealand Customs Service. Attaining this uh, accreditation was a key motivation for us listing on the NZX, and we have plans to list on the ASX in due course. Our compliance listing has helped raise the profile of the business, and it provides the government agencies that we deal with an assurance that we run the business in a professional and transparent way. Uh, we've got oversight of independent directors who instill best practice corporate governance. We have backing from reputable corporate and institutional investors. So ASB Bank is a cornerstone shareholder in Trade Window. And they've been there since day one. Keyside Holdings is a regional wealth fund who is our second largest shareholder. Beyond these shareholders, we have backing from several large family offices with backgrounds covering international shipping, oil and gas, commercial property, and technology. Our rapid growth has in part come through six acquisitions that we've made over the last five years. Uh, and where it makes sense, we'll make to uh, look for more opportunities and acquire incumbent software companies to integrate into our platform over time.
acquisitions provide trade window with a more certain low risk way of expanding the business, especially when it comes to moving into new markets. This is how we established our initial presence in Australia. A little bit about international trade. It's the lifeblood of the world economy with over 22 trillion cross-border transactions every year. In terms of volume, this equates to nearly 800 million 20-foot container movements traversing the globe. But even in this age of technological progress, you might be surprised to learn that international trade is still largely conducted using manual paper-based processes. And this system relies on the exchange of billions of pieces of paper being exchanged. Disconnected systems at each stage of the trade process, spanning procurement, packing, compliance, logistics, border clearance, payment, all relies on people entering and re-entering data. And this is no small task. If we think about uh, a single transaction, it often requires more than 20 entities being involved and between 10 to 20 paper documents, which en encompass 5,000 data points. So it's a, it's a big task. The flow of trade documents is critical for facilitating the physical movement of goods. The data provides buyers and sellers with an accounting record. It provides ocean carriers and logistics companies with instructions on what to do with the freight. And it provides border agencies with information for compliance, statistics, and revenue collection purposes. It's a market that has a humongous TAM, uh, supply chain software, it's estimated by Gartner to be worth approximately $32 billion, uh, growing at a CAGR of 14.3% uh, per annum. Further, there's large adjacent market opportunities for trade finance. To provide a bit more detail on how we create value for our customers, at, at a very basic level, we help, help our customers save time, save money, and mitigate operational risks. Our cube flat platform is what we call sector neutral. So simply put, it means that it's interoperable with solutions that are already used in companies such as ERP systems or industry specific platforms. Our security is paramount. Our system encrypts uh, customer data, both in rest and in transit. We adhere to best practice security protocols and a tw ISO 27001 certified. So going paperless is a no-brainer when it comes to dealing with high volumes of intricate data. Businesses reliant on manual paper-based processes commonly end up with delays caused by data entry and mistakes are costly. With goods held up at the border, additional costs are incurred or at the worst, in the worst case, perishable goods are spoiled. Transparency across supply chain means that everyone is on the same page. A verifiable single data set and source of truth means that bad actors can't defraud border agencies or banks. So Trade Window is on a mission to make trade easier and more accessible for a large number of businesses. Cube, our global trade platform, is where we're bringing together all the features and functionality required by our customers. We have a growing list of capabilities, including trade documents, ocean carrier bookings, supply chain tracking and visibility, certificates of origin, and encrypted data storage. Beyond trade compliance, we have a latent opportunity to provide financial products, including trade finance, foreign exchange, and insurance. Cross-selling new features and functionality is a key element of our revenue growth strategy. Uh, we're proud to serve leading brands across the dairy, meat, seafood, horticulture, and timber, manufacturing, FMCG, and logistics sectors. These businesses collectively are responsible for over 60 billion in trade each year. Our software is sector agnostic, so no matter what industry our customers operate, uh, we can help them save time, save money, and allow them to focus on the drivers that grow their businesses. We have low customer concentration risk with no single customer contributing more than 5% of our revenues. Our software is business critical, therefore customer relationships are sticky and 94% of our revenues are occurring, uh, and we have 94% revenue retention. Uh, Trade Window launched a capital raise on the New Zealand Stock Exchange on the 26th of March. We're seeking 2.2 million in total, 2 million via replacement, uh, which is open to both new and existing investors, and 200,000 via a share, share purchase plan open to existing investors based in New Zealand. 
Uh, funds will be used to gri drive growth in Australia by winning new customers and focusing on also uh, using funds to strengthen our balance sheet and provide the business with resilience. New shares will be priced at 17.5 cents each. Uh, this price represents a 10% discount on the volume weighted average price for the 20 days preceding the share offer. Uh, our offer provides exceptional value for a tech company with a big market opportunity growing 26% year on year. Our valuation at 20 million represents a three times multiple on the trading revenues of 6.2 million as at 31 March. The offer has a rolling close, meaning that applications will be settled and shares allotted in the order received. Our offer will close on the earlier of the placement being exhausted or tomorrow, which is the 19th of uh, April. We welcome your interest and thank you. Our next presenter is Simon Peters, founder and CEO at Development HQ. Affordable Housing Collective, CoLife, is a developer with 30 years experience, having developed over 1,000 properties with a value of $300 million. Development HQ. My name's Simon Peters. I've got 30 years of development experience, developed a number of properties, over $300 million in value. This is a quick overview of some of the assets that we've actually developed in two countries, Australia and New Zealand, just to give you an idea. A lot of residential subdivisions, uh, medium rise townhouses, mostly residential and some commercial. So the big idea that we have in seconds, there's a big problem in Australia right now. There's a rising demand for affordable housing. House prices are going up and the income of households aren't. In short, there's a huge amount of uh, property being built over here uh, in the four bedroom, sort of three to four bedroom space. Not a lot suitable for any other uh, type or demographic. These are mainly for families. <clears throat> Single person household uh, demographics are growing dramatically in this country um, and there's nowhere near enough property being built in that space. So the Queensland demographic where we're currently focused, 60% of the income is at under $1,000 a week for each household. And that's a significantly low number considering the price of housing and rental. Um, so why not just build affordable housing? That's actually what we're doing. After years of being in space, uh, I've decided and we have decided as a business that this is an area we really can make a difference in. So co-living is one of the ways or one of the forms of this type of development, uh, mainly to make it affordable. And it's also a, a really growing space internationally. And so what is it? Um, and who's it for? It's basically for nearly everybody. It's primarily designed for one or two people per room. Uh, there's a lot of women in this country over 55 uh, that are now single, they've had their families, they don't actually have enough money to buy a property and they don't have enough money to pay rent. They're usually nurses or um, service workers, what have you. So it also encompasses the essential work space around shopping centres, retail workers, as I said, nurses, educators, uh, police. There's so many areas that are underserved uh, and also young professionals. There are some large players globally in the space already. You can see here, um, Australia is very young in terms of our, uh, our um, penetration into this market, but it's very much a growing space. So the challenges really are economic health, regulatory policy, um, and affordability. So our solution is these co-living apartments and uh, housing. It's a, it's a, um, it's a, it generally makes it affordable due to the fact that people are actually sharing uh, service spaces like kitchens and what have you. But in general, people have their own actual bedroom that's safe and secure, and it's designed for one or two people. We also have, want to make sure that when we offer a triple bottom line, which is social, economic, and environmentally designed properties, that we actually have that audited by an international company. This organisation, One Planet Living Framework, encompasses these items, including uh, zero carbon, uh, the local culture and community, and what benefits are we adding back in terms of how we design, what we design, uh, and for what cohort must be measurable. Uh, this is our first project, currently has an approval, We're preparing for construction commencement within six months uh, with a value at 72 rooming accommodation, which is effectively shared accommodation in six buildings in Logan Home, uh, Queensland, that's southeast Queensland. 
So we're offering at the moment, uh, in short, a, uh, a first mortgage, 12.5% interest. This is to take out the current mortgage while we prepare for construction. And then once the construction's underway, we'll refinance that mortgage and put it into a construction loan from a traditional lender. It's, a, it's an example of one of the projects that we're doing, this one here. We have four or five of these projects with similar scenarios. Uh, and you'll see here uh, three other projects that we're currently underway with. Stage two, which is the Toowoomba project here on the left, is in for DA. We should expect that in two months' time, and we'll be constructing that this year. Similar scenario, similar offer, whilst we prepare for construction. Uh, and the other two projects, again, uh, in similar locations in Logan. That's our pipeline. These are some of our partners that we work with. We obviously do our best to make sure we have very, very high quality team behind us. Uh, right, you know, Ryder Levitt, Bucknell, Norton Rose, Fulbright Lawyers, Gensler Architects are the largest architectural firm on the planet, six and a half thousand staff in, in 52 cities. They designed the first project. They're not our only designers. We have others here. Bolo are modular home builders. We also have all our projects designed for modular home and construction. So we can build them traditionally for modular and in Australia, modular is fast becoming uh, an absolutely serious space. And we believe it's the future of all this type of development. And in fact, it's really well going forward. So the next steps really is have a look at our deal room. We are, we're online on Wholesale Investor. Um, book a call to discuss it. I'm happy to, to chat to anybody personally uh, and do a, an individual presentation, go into more depth and detail. And, um, and talk to us about investing. Thank you for your time. Our next presenter is Samir Sinha, co-founder and CEO at GlobalMedics.ai Virtual Hospital. GlobalMedics.ai platform revolutionized healthcare by integrating intelligent patient interactions, AI diagnostics, revenue cycle optimization, and expert human intervention for enhanced care coordination. Hi. I'm Samir. GlobalMedics.ai Virtual Hospital is not just the first of its kind digital platform for comprehensive care. It is a tribute to those doctors who were a beacon of hope during the darkest days of humanity. In April of 2021, 130 doctors from nine countries and a couple of technology people like me came together on a digital platform. These doctors work tirelessly 24 by 7, supporting 1,350 patients who were gasping for air due to COVID. The compassion knew no borders. So we called ourselves Global Medics. So great was the impact that Financial Review did this story on us. Medical researchers from Australian National University could see the potential of this project giving rise to new paradigms of care delivery. So they wrote up a technical paper for peer review. All this gave us the confidence to be able to reimagine how care could be delivered. The project gave us data and insights for building AI. But most importantly, it built very deep relationships with these 130 doctors turned angels. They started sharing with us the challenges they face at work. And when we dug deeper, we were aghast to come across this research. 74% of a doctor's time went into admin tasks. So we worked with our team of clinicians to co-design a solution that would work for them. Having spent a decade in AI, we knew generative AI could be used to enable these clinicians see 100 times more patients, deliver 10 times better clinical outcomes at one-tenth the effort. But the doctors found AI to be too risky, too insecure, um, and too complex for them to use. So we had to work with them to build a platform that was simple, but secure and stringent. 
we understand that different forms of AI and other software could be used like Lego building blocks, like puzzle pieces. They could be combined together to automate the processes that are holding our doctors back today. They could start from any part and then gradually expand. We've built a chatbot that can reach out to potentially millions of patients simultaneously. These patients, whenever they experience a symptom, they initiate a conversation with the bot and the bot asks them the same set of questions which a clinician would ask to investigate what's happening with the patient. Imagine all the consultation time that gets saved because this summary is presented to the doctor before an actual consultation. The patient can take a photograph of any symptom they are experiencing or any report they have received or a handwritten prescription and the AI reads the image, reads the handwriting and interprets it for the clinician and the summary is presented to the doctor. Now our AI can read maybe 500,000 pages of the patient's history and summarize that aspect which is relevant for the current complaints. It can then go further into medical research literature, which doubles every 73 days. And it picks up relevant content and presents that summary back to the clinician. When the patient walks into the chamber to meet the doctor, the doctor presses a button and they start talking to the patient in any of the 140 languages. Our AI can understand the conversation between the patient and the doctor, interpret what's happening and create patient notes and all other documentation. While we worked with some of the 130 doctors to co-design our solution, after it was built, we launched it in Australian Healthcare Week conference. We have subsequently listed it for physicians of American Medical Association to try it out and give us feedback. And the results that are coming through are very encouraging. They are also coming to us with new ideas on where we can take the solution because we can easily create new combinations by rearranging the Lego blocks. Supporting us in our journey has been Microsoft. Our solution is hosted on their marketplace. So their salespeople can sell our products and earn commissions. Several of our competitors are trying to make AI work in individual silos. Whereas we are solving for making all of those easy and secure for our target customers, the clinicians. We have a first mover advantage, but more importantly, because we are dealing with multiple areas, the amount of data that we collect is significantly higher. And in AI, data means everything. Some very experienced people have identified with the cause that we are driving and have joined with us in our journey to create this new paradigm of care. Experts are predicting that generative AI investments in healthcare will rise by 32% compounded annual growth rate in the next 10 years. So we are at a very unique position in history. We're raising just enough cash to be able to support our product development, working capital management, and sales and marketing to take us to the next phase. We invite you to join us in this journey of making generative AI 
have a positive impact on the world at large. Our next presenter is Stephen Su, CEO at INP Capital. INP Capital utilizes a global network and deep industry insights to target emerging technologies and visionary founders with potential for high growth. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Xu, CEO of INP Capital, a boutique investor firm specializing in opportunities strategies that capitalizing on market dynamics to deliver robust return to our investors. It is a pleasure to share with you today a unique opportunities that capitalize uh, economic cycles with strategy blind of Australia real estate and global cutting edge technology investment. We are here to explore how our targeted approach can create significant value for our investors. Before we proceed, please note this uh, presentation is for informational purpose only, does not constitute investment advice. It is intended for sophisticated investors who understand the risks associated with capital investment. Now look at what we face currently, the key challenges around the world. Significant volatility, sticky inflation, and geopolitical tensions. These challenges underscore the necessity for a refined investment strategy that mitigates risks while capitalizing on the opportunities this condition present. Nowadays, US Federal Reserve, RBA, ECB, all signal the message that they would consider normalizing the monetary policy from the previous tightening. This will trigger investors uh, look at their portfolio and thinking moving some of the capital to risk asset to capture the opportunities. Now it is the timing. It is the timing to look for quality assets, either at the value or within reasonable price range. Under the current economic um, conditions, we identified two sets of opportunities for growth and value. First, we identify mixed price assets in sectors such as senior living, childcare, industrial and logistics, and medical assets, which are prime for recovery yet lack capital. Additionally, we focus on distressed assets and overvalued technology sectors requiring sophisticated capital restructuring. This dual approach enable us to harness diverse market dynamics for robust return. Building on these identified opportunities, let's look at our target approach. Our strategic assets allocation is designed to harness maximum value from the current market dynamics, distributing 70% of the capital in Australian real estate and 30% in technology ventures. This method is not merely about the investment. Mm -hmm. It is about prudent assets advancement. Focusing on Australia only properties ensures we benefit from resilient economy and a stable political environment, complemented by strong population growth. We commit to 100% asset back investment approach with no leverage and no for the development risk. Minimizing exposure to the speculative risk while ensuring stable and strong rental income for cash flow. As the population grows, the value of property is expected to rise steadily, creating a rel reliable source of value growth over time. Distinctly, in the technology allocation, we are not casting net uh, in a blind pool. Instead, we have pre-selected six investment candidates from which we'll choose two to three to invest 
focusing on mid to late stage companies at growth inflection point, those points for IPOs with solid business and financial fundamentals. This deliberate selection span sectors like AI, environmental tech, uh, clean tech, and the EV for commercial vehicles. Across diverse regions, including Australia, Canada, and the US, ensuring we capture high growth potential while diversifying risk. All the opportunity were identified, the approach we tailored or supported by our remarkable team. Our combined expertise total more than 100 years across various industry. With significant board director experience and senior, senior management expertise, we're well equipped to manage your investment wisely. Additionally, we benefit from the insight of our industrial uh, advisor, Heng Yi Pacific, known for their awarding winning projects in the real estate sector, uh, both in Australia and New Zealand. Together, we are committed to leveraging our comprehensive market knowledge and the strategic insight to secure and manage investment that delivers substantial returns. Now look at um, two like cases, uh, real cases, um, the first one is the industrial uh, real estate um, project. Uh, it is an industrial warehouse. The average yield is 5.5% 5 5, 5 per annum. And uh, the ROI for the capital growth is well, like 16% um, percent per annum. It's very high. It's more than uh, the natural um, the land uh, appreciation. The reason for that is we identified the opportunity to convert this warehouse to a mixed use um, residential apartment. Um, so this without any uh, development work, we did uh, a permit successfully and sold the property with the permit, which generated material return. Overall, the project is actually more than 20% ROI and per annum uh, equivalent to 16% RRI, IRR. So this one highlights our, how um, our strategy in selecting and the managing assets provides both stability and the growth. The second case is in the technology sector is a Canadian uh, ad tech unicorn. We invest in several rounds and managed to have a so round two um, and has an exit uh, in one of their uh, large financial rounds. So within three years, uh, we returned 43 times um, cash to the investor for this individual investment. Um, so this demonstrates our ability to identify and cultivate technology ventures that nearing their growth Inflection point, uh, offering you know potential for substantial returns. All right, look at um, let let's look at the detail of the fund. Uh, we target a size of hundred million AUD. It's a minimal investment of five hundred k. We aim for a twenty percent RR structure within a, a managed investment scheme, uh, a unit trust overseen by um, IMP Capital. We commit uh, 10 million as an initial major co-investment and the scoring of confidence in the fund's success. Currently, we have 25% commitment to the fund and we'll make our first close by end of June with a minimum 50 uh, million target. So in conclusion, um, remember uh, Warren Buffett's word, which I like very much, um, is be fearful when others uh, are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. So this philosophy drives us, um, drives our approach, pushing uh, us to seize opportunities when others see challenges. In the end, thank you for considering the MP, JC, and GMT opportunity fund. Let's capitalize on this dynamic cycle together for superior investment returns. Thank you very much.
Our next presenter is Aldo Michio, Chairman and Co-Founder at Aether Pacific Pharmaceuticals LTD. Aether Pacific pioneers high-value pharmaceutical solutions merging medicine and science to enhance health outcomes and elevate quality of life. Hi, I'm Aldo Michio, Chairman and Co-Founder of Aether Pacific Pharmaceuticals. Aether Pacific Pharmaceuticals is a whole of plant pharmaceutical medicine company producing medicines from whole plant materials, primarily at the moment, cannabis, um, but also other medicines and other plant medicines that our company has in its novel compound portfolio. Um, Aether Pacific is the parent company which operates four business units, two of those which are uh, uh, entities in themselves, one being Aether Pacific Pharmaceuticals Fiji and the other being pain, the um, pain clinic and Hardy Health. And then Medical Kiwi is our cultivation unit. Um, on the screen here, you can see the descriptions of each. Hardy Health is 100% owned by APP, a company we acquired about um, three years ago, which has a portfolio of novel compounds discovered in the Solomon, Solomon Islands. And these novel compounds um, or a number of various conditions, some of them associated with similar conditions to cannabis. So we're looking to create formulations of these compounds combined with cannabis into capsules, pills, transdermal patches and the like. Medical Kiwi is our cultivation division, which we have a fully indoor facility climate control in um, Christchurch, New Zealand, and we uh, have about seven strains of cannabis, which we are currently growing. And it's three of these strains that are in the Australian market as a GMP um, medicine, uh, New Zealand grown flowers for the first time under a New Zealand brand medical Kiwi. Main Clinic is our in-house um, GP clinic. We have two physical locations, one in Christchurch, one in Nelson, and then a telehealth clinic, which runs across the whole country, providing prescriptions across the country. And then we have Ava Pacific Fiji, which will be cannabis cultivation, but also extraction of oils and also extraction into powderization for capsules. And Hardy Health Extraction Hub will be based in, in Fiji. Um, we've achieved a few milestones over the last four or five years. Um, most significantly, are the certifications around growing cannabis. Um, and of course, the funds that were raised to date, which are around $20 million raised to date. Um, and we've um, got our Fiji agreement with the government, where we'll be working with the government to establish cannabis industry in, F in Fiji. Um, what makes um, Aether Pacific different to what is considered, a, say, a cannabis company is that, of course, we do more than just cannabis. So we have other whole plant medicines, which we are developing as pharmaceutical medicines. We're the only um, cannabis related company in Australasia that has a university, Victoria University of Wellington, as a share a shareholder. Um, and of course, with that, Ferrier Research Institute, which is Victoria University's R&D arm, is working closely with us on developing the Hardy Health novel compounds, one of which has been fully patented. And Fiji will provide for us a hub where we can, um, of course, grow cannabis for global markets and produce medicines from capsules to various other uh, dosage forms, of course, um, pills, and then also transdermal patches. Um, the Hardy Health novel compounds that, that have been discovered treat a number of conditions. As I mentioned, a lot of them are conditions that cannabis also treats. And so we aim to produce formulations and capsules and pills and the like that can, can increase the efficacy and increase the bioavailability of the active compounds that will treat those certain, certain conditions. Um, to date, uh, we have our, our flowers as, as described that are in, entering into the Australian market. We've been selling bulk flowers. Uh, our first bulk flower sales were last year in January. Um, and now we're selling packaged medicine flowers as well. And as you can see, future products that we're looking to launch are the tinctures, powders, patches, and of course the formulations with the Hardy Health um, product. So we believe that these formulations are the future, like cannabis medicines will enter into, I guess, a branded regime. Uh, flowers will always be in existence for prescription medicine, 
Um, but um, we, we see the real growth will be coming in the dosage controls. GPs have more confidence in prescribing a, a dosage control capsule or a pill or, or, or a patch. So we're putting a lot of effort, and it hence the reason why we acquired Hardy Health, is to be able to create our own IP protected formulated medicines, which include cannabis. Here are, here, are, here are two of the brands that we're going into Australia, Medical Kiwi Aura and Medical Kiwi Kai, and some of our sales agreements that we have in place through Europe and um, UK and Australia, um, and future agreements that we're in the middle of finalising at the moment. Um, so I just want to talk to you a little bit about our global strategy. Um, we're trying to do something that's quite unique and we've set up um, agreements, joint ventures um, and various other forms of agreements with various manufacturers that can provide the medicines we need um, pr prior to our extraction facility being completed in Fiji. So we have various relationships in different countries. This graph here sh shows and describes what we are doing in terms of setting up an Asia-Pacific supply base that includes New Zealand, Fiji, and Thailand. We've set up some exclusive agreements in Thailand, not only for procuring flowers, uh, but also for the manufacturing of the various medicine types um, in Thailand. And Fiji will be our own course cultivation facility and eventually our own, our own supply of those dosage products. And then you've got New Zealand, which is the home of the company, uh, where we will continue to do the high-grade flowers in our indoor facility and also expand our pain clinic and also bring into the pain clinic a pharmacy model as well. So we're in the middle of the stage of setting up our own pharmacy um, network within New Zealand to supply our products through New Zealand. We're looking to raise $4.5 million as a pre-IPO, uh, which we are hoping to achieve before the end of this year. Now, that would be dependent on, on the results and making sure that we've given the company the best chance to succeed when we do list on the ASX. And at this stage, we're working towards having our application based on our end of June 2004 audit and looking to raise $4.5 million. Um, that use of funds uh, covers a number of things, of course. Um, scaling our Christchurch facility, our stage one, uh, Fiji Extraction and Cultivation Facility, expanding the pain clinic and introducing the pharmacy network, uh, working capital, and of course, ASX listing costs. Our valuation, um, as you can see, is currently valued at around the 56 million New Zealand dollar mark. Uh, we've been on, we're a public company, we've been on the secondary exchange called Catalyst in New Zealand uh, with, as for retail investors. Um, for about the last four or five months, and and we have the valuations here that speaks speaks to that. Um, been a been a public company for some time now with over twelve hundred shareholders. Um, we we of course run to the FMA regulations and the and the same regulations as NZX companies do on on Catalyst. Of course, we're public publicly audited. We've got a board of four and an advisory board of three. Um, of course, we have we have patents from our novel compound, particularly one, and we can provide those details to any interested in, in, in investors. The patent portfolio is has quite high potential value. Victoria University's Ferrier Institute um, um, lobbied the Victoria University to remain as a shareholder, and the, the university, of course, agreed to, and they see the value of hard party and party in these, these um, novel compounds we have. And of course, our intention is to list on the ASX this year. Um, our further growth, our growth strategies are centered around the global supply chain. Uh, we've essentially been able to turn on the supply tap in, out of um, New Zealand, Fiji or, or Thailand and deliver finished medicines to patients throughout the globe, um, including of course, Europe, Australia and Southeast Asian countries as they they regulate or to bring into legislation regulations for medicinal cannabis over the next year or two. There's a number of countries that have that lined up for this year and next year, including Malaysia, Vietnam, Korea, and Japan. So the cannabis market, medicinal cannabis market, of course, is growing. Every year, more countries are coming on board. 
and the um, demand for high quality medicinal cannabis remains strong. So as you can see here, you know, we have GMP medicines um, and, and sales. We have an agreement in place which will give us an exclusive position within the global market of having Fiji and cannabis products. Um, a global supply chain, which gives us quite a unique position to be able to deliver from raw ingredients right through to deliver patient medicine. Key partners have been secured, contracts are in place for sales, um, and and our forecasts for the next two to three years uh, are looking strong and underpinned, like I mentioned, by those um, by those those agre those agreements. That sum sums up. And if you've got any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact myself or the team at Wholesale Investor, and uh, we can provide you with the information that you need. Uh, most of it, of course, is in our data room. And uh, thank you for listening. Our next presenter is Mr. Stephen Comerford, Project Manager at FP Paradigm. Revolutionising sustainable packaging, FP Paradigm unveils its eco-friendly solutions. Hi, I'm Stephen Comerford. I'm a Project Manager working on uh, several of the R&D activities into sustainable materials. Um, I've worked in the food and beverage industry for the last 20 years. I've worked for companies such as Arnott's Biscuits, Coca-Cola Amatil and Dairy Farmers. And the food and beverage industry, unfortunately, is falling short of some of its packaging commitments, where just 18% of plastic packaging is being recycled. Also, food waste has become a major environmental issue and one that needs addressing in not just Australia, but globally. We're working really hard on several projects to address both this plastic issue and also um, this food waste issue. Uh, I'd like to share some of those projects with you today and then at the end uh, present an investment opportunity for you. So we're focused in our R&D around three different areas, new plastic technology, food waste management, and also measurement and consumer research. The R&D program is set to transform fossil-based fuels plastic in the food and beverage industry, not just here, but globally. And certainly we're working really hard on these eight projects, which I'll introduce to you now. The first of which is around organic recycling technology. This technology looks at a better way of recycling. We're looking at synthesis of biomass materials, and that combines biomass materials with new plastics. We're also looking at carbon utilisation, and carbon utilisation takes CO2 gas and converts that into plastic. We also have three exciting projects around food waste management. One includes a nanowire sensor, which is used for tracing uh, food and food packaging. We're also looking at a colour metric sensor, of which indicates when food uh, goes off or spoils. Um, this could potentially replace a best before date and give consumers a better opportunity to see when their food's going off. We're also using blockchain technology to trace food and source as well. The other technology that we're looking at is also a life cycle analysis of all of these programs and also some consumer research. Um, the consumer research is quite unique because it looks at all of the technologies and we will know that we have um, some projects that are really user-friendly for consumers. So all these projects are being conducted at the University of New South Wales, and I'd like to give you a short update of one of those projects. The organic recycling project looks at taking solid waste and feedstock um, that isn't normally being taken in the marketplace, such as contaminated waste. It uses a technology or solvent technology to look at making it into nanoparticles and we get an aqueous dispersion. From that, we can make new plastic and then preform into different materials. Some of those materials that we can make from this are new bottles made out of PET plastic or new trays. So it has application across a broad range of opportunities in the food industry, biscuits, cake, fruit, meat, seafood, coffee, etc. This alternative technology has some great advantages. We really are looking to improve the efficiency of recycling and waste management. We can utilize contaminated feedstock to, to date that hasn't been a, a possibility. And we're also looking at how we can transform the reliance on petroleum-based plastics 
um, by utilizing this green chemistry. And we're also looking for a cost reduction by using these technologies. As mentioned, the opportunity is large. The Australian market right now is worth $4 billion and it's expected to grow at about 2%. But what's emerging right now is recycled plastic and the demand for that. And that's growing at about 11.8%. And it's worth almost $200 million today. We really do see this coming um, ahead in leaps and bounds in the coming future. We've already secured great partners. We've got Pablo and Rusty's Coffee on board, Arnott's Biscuits Group, Taka Plastics and Paco Industries, which has a sub subcontract um, to look at these R&D projects. The current experimental um, uh, expenditure at the moment is $23 million. And there's a further $23 million in 2024 that's coming online. So in summary, the investment is quite, opportun uh, quite a good opportunity. Uh, we're seeking $5.7 million in, in a convertible note. Um, FP Paradigm has an advanced finding that's already been awarded we will pay an interest of 10% quarterly over two years, and the option can be exercised soon after that. We've made significant progress with the university, and there's a large market opportunity. So why don't you come and have a talk with us today, and our details are at the end of this presentation. Thanks for your time. Our next presenter is Mike Pettit, CEO at V-Glass. V-Glass's 100% recyclable, next-generation vacuum-insulated glass, VIG technology, makes affordable, ultra-high efficiency, windows a reality in the $67 billion global insulated glass market, boosts LEED certification, and accelerates the trend towards sustainable, net-zero energy buildings. I'm Mike Pettit, CEO of V-Glass. We've developed next-generation vacuum-insulated glass technology for affordable, ultra-high efficiency windows. Vacuum-insulated glass, or VIG for short, is like a flat, transparent thermos bottle for windows. It is century-old, proven technology. A V-glass fig can insulate more than three times better than today's dual-pane windows. The problem is that buildings consume a huge amount of energy, and windows are the weak thermal link where much of that energy is wasted. On the left, you see current window technology plotted on a graph with decreasing cost on the x-axis and increasing efficiency on the y. More than 50% of US window stock today is clear glass, while almost all new construction uses dual pane, both low cost, low efficiency. With triple panes, you get a little more efficiency with a little more cost. With first-generation vacuum glass, you get a little more efficiency for a lot more cost. In the US, triple panes and first-generation VIGs are simply too expensive to achieve any meaningful market penetration. V-Glass has broken this cost-performance paradigm by having the highest thermal efficiency of any glazing product on the market produced at cost comparable to today's conventional windows. Here's our unique product design, the Mark III C, a market-ready minimum viable product supported by significant intellectual property. It involves two panes of glass sealed near the edge with spacers between the panes where a vacuum is drawn. This vacuum gap is about the thickness of human hair. Our flexible edge seal involves the friction welding of metal to glass, which has proven very durable in Department of Energy lab testing. Most importantly, B-glass can be affordably produced at room temperature, just like today's conventional windows. Here you see an infrared image of two recently installed B-glass VIGs on a day when the outside temperature was minus four degrees Fahrenheit. Note first that the B-glass windows are indeed as warm as a wall more than three times the thermal efficiency of the dual pane windows you see in blue. Second, there's a 15 degree temperature difference between the dual pane window on the right and the V-glass windows, which will make this room very uncomfortable for anyone sitting near the windows. For the homeowner, upgrading to V-glass can reduce monthly HVAC costs by up to 50%, achieve a payback period of less than five years, 
and more than a 30% return. VGLASS is targeted at residential and commercial buildings globally, a market estimated at $67 billion annually. We will go to market using existing industry supply chains where we have established relationships. So to be clear, VGLASS is a technology company that will license its IP to established glass manufacturers and window OEMs who will bring our product and technology to market globally. To secure these licensing agreements, we must go through an industrial scale-up process where we move out of the lab into a pilot plant, demonstrate that V-Glass can be manufactured at or better than our cost targets, and that it works in real life environments where we are well on our way with more than $200,000 in order backlog for demonstration projects. We also have deep collaborative relationships with two large manufacturers, one in North America that's been supplying us with free glass and testing services since 2012, and a European manufacturer that will invest in our upcoming seed round. They both visited our lab and purchased V-Glass VIGs to test which has generated more than $100,000 in revenue. The EU relationship is progressing much faster, which makes sense given how much more expensive energy is in Europe. And based on precedent, V-Glass will likely be acquired by a large glass manufacturer. Here you see a list of industry transactions. Note first two liquidity events involving companies producing dynamic glass which is mature, established technology. The first is St. Gobain's two-stage acquisition of Sage Glass, which occurred when Sage was planning to build its first production facility, a place V-Glass could be in about three years. St. Gobain purchased 50% of Sage for $80 million and the rest two years later for an undisclosed amount. Next is Gauzy who's planning an IPO this year at a $600 million valuation. Here are two funding rounds involving PV glass technology, which is a couple years ahead of V glass in its development. Here, an early stage first generation big company, Luxwall, building a plant in Michigan, targeting the US commercial market. You'll also notice the prevalence of strategic partners and government support just like with V-Glass. The takeaways here, investors are funding emerging technologies in the glass industry. They see vacuum glass demand growing in North America, despite its high cost. Government support for energy efficiency technology remains very strong. These are all very positive trends for V-Glass. We also distinguish ourselves from this group in one very important way. Vacuum insulated glass is the only technology that could serve the entire global market. First generation vacuum glass was a great idea, but what good is innovative technology that no one can afford? Now is the time the market is ready for affordable V glass to drive rapid market penetration of high efficiency windows. Industry players agree that V glass could be disruptive. The last technology to do this in this market was low emissivity coating in the 1980s. Like V-Glass, it was developed with DOE funding and technical support. Like V-Glass, its value proposition offered significantly higher thermal efficiency at a small cost premium. Once commercialization began, low E coatings achieved 20% share in the US residential market within five years and almost 50% in year 10. Today, low E coatings are everywhere. Could the growth of low E coatings be a proxy for the market adoption of V-Glass? Our investment thesis begins with V-Glass's disruptive design and IP portfolio, which creates long-term value and significant barriers to entry. 18 patents have been awarded, 13 are pending, with many more to come. An accelerating focus on global sustainability and resilience brings significant tailwinds for our affordable energy efficiency technology. 
These tailwinds show up in the form of non-dilutive public grants and direct funding for demonstration projects, where we have a large order backlog. Our 10-year relationship with the Department of Energy also provides access to national lab engineers and scientists, which keeps us at the forefront of building technology. We've accomplished all this with a very small technical team, all highly innovative problem solvers named inventors on more than 200 patents. Our advisors have relevant industry experience and have taken companies from ideation to exit. On the right, you see numerous organizations supporting and collaborating with us, which allows B-Glass to make a very disproportionately large impact from a relatively small footprint. As for me, I'm an engineer MBA, former investment banker with business development, capital markets, and operational experience. Most recently, I was an executive in a publicly traded company where I started up a business unit from scratch and grew it to more than a billion dollars in enterprise value, more than 175 employees, and an international footprint. As a tech company, we will generate very high margins under our licensing model, targeting royalty rates of 5% in the residential market and 10% in commercial. We expect to grow rapidly once commercialization begins, generating 20 million in operating profit on about a half a percent global market share in year six, which could be accomplished without adding to the two large manufacturers already evaluating our technology. We've raised $6 million to date, $4 million from non-dilutive grants, with the balance raised primarily under a safe that converts at an $8.5 million valuation cap or a 10 to 30% discount. Things are moving quickly at B-Class, so we're pursuing multiple funding paths simultaneously. Today, we're looking to raise $750,000 under the safe, which will allow us to expand our technical team, accelerate development, and begin delivering on order backlog. We recently applied for more DOE grants, which could lead to 2.5 million in total funding. No guaranteed win, but we have a very high success rate here. We're also in discussions with several investors about leading a $3 million seed round to begin moving out of the lab into a pilot plant. We've already circled a million dollars to co-invest alongside the large EU manufacturer once a lead is found. We expect to close this seed round in late 2024 at a valuation much higher than the $8.5 million on the pre-seed round. Future funding of 15 million will be raised in two rounds to build the pilot plant and for global rollout. We expect 50% or more of all future funding to come from non-dilutive sources. That said, B-Glass is likely to be acquired well in advance of all this capital being raised. I'll conclude with a few final comments. Energy drives the global economy and human flourishing. Affordable, ultra-high efficiency V-Glass is 100% recyclable, reduces carbon emissions, saves energy and money. Our value proposition is compelling without government subsidies, but with them, market adoption will occur much faster. Thank you for allowing me to share the V-Glass story with you, and I invite you to join us in bringing our disruptive technology to market. Hi everyone, my name is Steve Torso, the founder of Wholesale Investor and Capital HQ. I hope you're enjoying today's investment showcase. We plan this to be the first of many investment showcases which we are going to be hosting. So my topic for today is going to be talking about some of the, the trends that we're actually seeing in this ecosystem. And I, I suppose what we observe on a day-to-day -day basis and how that can impact you either from an investor's perspective or also from a founder's perspective. So let's get right into it. So the first one is, is that, you know, the agenda we're going to be covering is going to be talking about a bit of a summary of 2023. Now, I gave this presentation about sort of two months ago, and I think some of those reference, some of those things that we learned in 2023 are just as relevant now. I'll be talking about the business and technology trends. I'll be talking about AI and its impact. You know, we're starting to see that unfold more and more. I'll be talking about venture in 2024 and beyond. 
And also I'll be covering what the future startup is going to look like because we're already starting to see these signs already. And you can think about how you can either re reposition yourself or what does that mean for your portfolio of companies that you're invested into. And I'll give some high level of things that we've got coming up from a wholesale investor and a capital HQ perspective. So 2023 summary, to put it really simply, it was a return of the, the Magnificent Seven. There was nearly $5 trillion worth of value created from those companies. Why that's important for us is because typically a lot of the investors in our ecosystem, be it the high net worth and the family office, etc are invested into those companies so they would have experienced those turns so what that could have meant for a lot of investors is they become a lot more liquid over the last 12 months from those companies if they had invested into them we'd also saw the crypto market this also was another good source of investors becoming more liquid because they started to see from the the bearish sentiment the crypto winter you know that we experienced they started to see things like Bitcoin going up 155% and then Solana doing 518%, a lot of that sort of in the last three months. So it was a good sort of finish to the year. This was the big trend and we're seeing this more and more commonly, but there was massive job cuts across the tech sector and I'll talk about that more. There was over 260,000. And obviously the one I don't need to talk about too much is that fundraising was well down on what it was previously. The IPO market was still closed, but the obvious one is that Generative AI really captured our attention. And then likewise, the I suppose the hardware around that with NVIDIA just going through the roof uh, in 2023 and then obviously in 2024 as well, right? But it really did capture our attention because it brought to us a new layer of what is possible with XYZ. Um, founders and investors sentiment, I'll cover that really quickly. Definitely founders felt beaten up, uh, tired and burnt out. Uh, some of you watching this may may, uh, can, can be, may be able to relate to that. Uh, even if you're on the founder and the investor side, you could probably relate to that really well as well. Um, then also many have actually had significant cuts over the last 12 months, which I think, sorry, last two years, which I think is important to note. And I actually just did a post on LinkedIn about that uh, yesterday. Um, so a lot of companies have made changes to what they're doing. Fundamentally, founders are still optimistic, which is really, which is what's most important. But also they've realized the capacity of what they can actually do with smaller teams, with outsourcing, with software, and also with AI. And then many of investors, uh, from the investor sentiment perspective, many have experienced basically 18 to 24 months of damage control, uh, lost businesses, and then obviously concerns with their portfolio. But they're also now optimistic about 2024. But with cautious optimism because they're still dealing with some of the challenges over the last two years because it just doesn't disappear overnight. Um, and the the other one that's sort of coming more and more prevalent is the concerns about future exit paths. Um, there is optimism around IPOs uh, and obviously some of the recent IPOs as well, but then some of the regulatory aspects around M&A and so forth are becoming more and more done, not just in Australia, but also globally uh, as well. So the business and technology trends, I'll cover a few of those that we find super interesting. And you know, this is from the perspective of the trends are going to be impacting the next decade, right? So firstly, you know, the, the great succession, you know, we're seeing this more and more. This, you know, effectively is going to be over 500 million businesses worldwide, 40% of them are, are family owned, and they're likely to go through succession over the next sort of 10 to 20 years. Uh, the expansion of private market opportunities. You know, the private markets will soar beyond $30 trillion in the next 10 years um, with less companies actually seeking to list. And there's a whole bunch of different reasons for that. And then the rise of non-bank lending, and I'll sort of cover that. But this is, you know, I think the easiest way for me to explain what's so exciting about now, even though we've had two punishing years beforehand, what's exciting about right now is that effectively it's one of the most exciting times for investors who are, who are interested in either yield or growth to be making their bets or to be making their investments. Um, and, you know, there's potential returns that go along with that. So this has been a topic that we've now been talking about for the last sort of 12 months, baby boomer succession, the greatest wealth transfer. Last time I talked about it, just the baby boomer transfer of wealth to, uh, to sort of millennials. Um, and this time it's more about the business succession part. And it's really interesting when you look at some of the stats, that effectively they're predicting that by 2045, there'll be a transfer of over $84 trillion worth of assets, which is an astonishing amount of money. 
And the the sad reality is, is only a thirty percent of family owned businesses survive that succession down to the next generation. So that then does create a whole new layer of opportunity for investors that are interested in investing into traditional, you know, in, into traditional businesses that may be going through some type of succession. But it will be the greatest wealth transfer. And, you know, we, we're doing a lot of work with a company called Volube Exchange that are basically facilitating that end-to-end -end process for companies that want to help the management and employees go through the buyout option, you know, of the actual founder so the founders can actually receive their, their uh you know, their, their payday, and then the management and employees can also gain in the rewards of the company whilst also passionately building the businesses that they're already working at. Private market opportunities, as mentioned before, this is becoming a massive area. Um, and some of these stats, just to, to give you an idea, the size of the, the assets are sitting inside so interesting, but just private markets in general, the actual growth is expected to continue at around about sort of 12.8% 12, 12 CAGR going forward. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for investors in that space. Now, when we get onto the innovation trends that we see impact the next decade, obviously AI, you know, Sundar put it best when he said AI technology will be the biggest technological shift in our lifetimes, possibly bigger than the internet. Now, why I love that statement so much is if you think about what the internet did to media in general, right? is effectively first what innovation does is it replaces the value of the incumbent. And then the second thing what it does is it then moves exponentially beyond it. And you see that, and I did it in my opening presentation at uh, Emergence where I showed the examples of classified ads. You know, the last company sort of, you know, Fairfax sold to Channel 9 for $4 billion, right? But if you actually look at the value of things like seek, realestate.com.au, car sales and domain, Combine those entities are worth $40 billion. They were 10 times what Fairfax was been, was at the end of it. So if you think about AI and its capacity, and it will do this faster, I and mean, there's a whole bunch of different reasons for that, and I sort of mentioned that on my last slide, but effectively the growth of AI and its potential role in how much revenue can be generated, first it will replace the value of the incumbent, which is the internet, and then secondly, it will go ex move exponentially beyond that. And that's why you can see a lot of hype and a lot of bets being made right now because people want to invest into that future infrastructure and capitalize on that opportunity. Um, the other thing that's really taking place is you see the convergence, uh, the exponential growth and convergence of a lot of platform technologies. Um, Kathy Wood and ARK Invest, I, I'm big fans of their work. They do a lot of research and a lot of talk around what are the different platform technologies. And, and they, they cover things like, you know, they, they highlight like blockchain, for example, as one of them, uh, energy storage as another, AI as another, genomics as another area, and then robotics being the fifth one. There's a lot of actually convergence of these taking place right now. And she highlights in this, uh, for example, ener energy storage and robotics alone could add 30% real GDP by 2030. And AI could dwarf both their contributions. So that really helps you put into context why this next decade is super exciting. And the convergence of these different trends, you know, really is going to create an exponential growth opportunity for investors, going back to what I said beforehand. And then this is why we did our theme for our emergence conferences, the era of abundance. Because if you really think about it, the role that each of those different pl platform technologies can play and how they can impact the way we live, work, play, whether it be food, whether it be energy, you know, the core sort of fundamentals to survive, it can actually dramatically transform that. And whilst there's you know, still a lot of areas which have you know, issues that have different shortages of areas, you can see how over the next sort of five to 10 years, that could really begin to, to start to change. So that's super exciting, I think, from an investor's perspective. Um, and something which can make a big difference down the track. So, you know, next next thing I'm going to be highlighting is that in this process with this exponential growth, you know, we're and from an AI perspective, we are going to see a content explosion. You know, we're seeing that already. Some of the stuff that I saw from Sora, I just thought was phenomenal. You know, you we're seeing that. You know, whether it be on YouTube, whether it be on LinkedIn, whether it be on Twitter, there is an absolute explosion of content going on at the moment. Um, and obviously, in the written format is one part, but now you're also seeing multimodal uh, as well. And all the AIs are moving towards that direction of being more multimodal. 
Um, AI bots, you know, we're going to see that across everywhere. Google just did their demo day the other day and they had this as a, as a key area of focus. The reality is you see a whole bunch of uh, people popping up online. Some people I follow as well, uh, where they're really encouraging. And I, I think on LinkedIn, every, every day I see another three to five people adding me that position themselves as AI experts. Uh, but the reality is, you know, AI bots will play a role in the way in which customers can be served because it allows companies like ours, like yours, or like your portfolio companies to be able to take their IP and what was normally sort of done by humans on a day-to-day -day basis, it can be actually, you know, automated inside these bots. Now that does come with its own risks, its own challenges and so forth. But, you know, over time, people will fine tune the information, they'll fine tune the models. And a lot of those bugs will ultimately be sort of uh, fixed. Uh, personal AI solutions, you know, every fan, like you can see, there's a lot of different solutions now coming out the, for help in the individual personally, um, whether it be, you know, uh, through OpenAI with their different GPTs. And I forget the other company that's just sort of, uh, that, that's providing a whole bunch of different examples for this. Um, or even if you look at um, with Microsoft with their Copilot, like effectively their Copilot landing page is really personally uh, focused on what you can do. Uh, if you look at Meta, what they've just released now with WhatsApp as an example, it's very much personal focused in that you can add it. Google, even that they've, they've added to their own chatbot, you know, they've added generative AI where you can ask personal questions for yourself. So the personal AI solution is really coming into play and that can really help individuals uh, you know, in lots of different areas, whether it be from health, whether it be for finances, whether it be just personal productivity, which I've highlighted. And then obviously automation. Enterprise AI is probably the area I'm most excited about because I just sit there, you know, you really can see, and I'll cover it sort of down the track, but effectively the enterprise potential, when it has, uh, when they're able to solve the area of sort of you know, information storage and then execution of items, you know, it will be an absolute game changer for what is possible for individual companies. And then AI agents, so the actual ability to execute. So that combination of memory that sits inside enterprise AI and then AI agents being able to complete end-to-end -end tasks. And once again, they'll have their own issues when they first start, but ultimately over time, they'll be refined and refined and they'll become very, very well drilled. Um, but, you know, that, that ability for uh, generation, then memory and then execution will absolutely change the fundamental nature of business. And, you know, there's a lot of different implications that come along with that. And this one I love from Peter Diamandis, where he highlights that the future unicorns will be created with less than 10 staff. Like as an investor, as a founder, like I just do not know how you cannot be more excited by a statement like that. But the reality is we're starting to see it play out in front of us. And there's some incredible companies that are, that are doing a lot of great work. Um, that have built, they're already, you know, sort of in motion, you know, on looking to achieve that goal. I know Sam Altman took that even further and said that, you know, the future, you know, there will be companies that will be, could be unicorns with just one person, which is an incredibly exciting, uh, you know, thing to think about. So the impact of AI in 2023 and 2024, I think this would be, you know, and I'll talk about some of the downsides and then I'll talk about some of the upsides that go along with it. Mass redundancies, they will absolutely continue. In fact, if you look at it, they're actually mentioning it in the headline statements. Uh, Cold Fusion put out a, a video, you know, just recently where they're talking about how companies are just secretly letting go of people. You know, there's some companies that are announcing it's because of AI. There's others that are, are not announcing it's because of AI. They're just doing it. Tesla, just let go of 10% of their workforce, Right. And we all know that in big corporations, they could, you know, a lot of them could probably, you know, reduce their headcount by anywhere between 25 to 50%. And so I believe, you know, my personal belief is this will be, it'll be a year on year continuation that these mass reduction from big, from the bigger tech companies and the corporates will continue. The only reason they're not doing more right now is just the sheer cost that's associated with a lot of these redundancies. And the areas they will absolutely be targeting will be the middle managers, the supervisors, the cross team coordinators, et cetera. They will all be in the firing line. And they're all highlighting this announcement that's all about streamlining. It's all about sort of connecting sort of leadership directly to the actual sort of workers. Um, but effectively, you know, part of the key reason is a lot of companies have had to build in a bunch of redundancies inside of it. But, you know, between different software solutions and AI, it really does help actually solve that. Um, and then more outsourcing. You know, we're seeing this more and more now with companies where instead of actually hiring in their own country, they're now looking to outsource. 
The other reality is, and I know this for Australia, you know, the employment, they're trying to make employment laws in such a way where it makes it more and more difficult for employers. And this has happened a lot in a lot of Western countries. Uh, yeah, and you're seeing, like, for example, UPS. And it's funny how it's really interesting to see how massive union action, massive announcements of union wins, and then literally within three months, you're seeing massive job cuts, you know, across those different companies where they just got uh, big wins. So the combination of outsourcing and also the combination of redundancy, you'll see, you're just going to see this more and more. And then the, the sheer move to a flatter organizational structure um, where those middle management roles disappear and it just leads to flatter organizational structure. So, you know, to me, there's some of the impacts we're already seeing and that you're going to see just becoming more and more obvious, you know, going forward. So the outcome for that, so now this is on the positive side, there will be an absolute explosion of new startups because the barriers to entry, the barriers to, to actually starting a business are actually quite low and the capacity to generate revenue is also a lot quicker. Um, and obviously from a software perspective, a lot of startups being built with utilizing AI and low and no code software solutions. Um, the need for the large funding rounds sort of really does disappear for companies, unless it's for like deep tech businesses or for compute power, which is typically what the large rounds are for at the moment, you know, a lot of those big funding rounds, so the need for them gets removed because they just don't need to hire as many people as what they needed previously. And then the last one is, is that companies can move to profitability very quickly, a lot quicker than what they used to. And, you know, this becomes exciting, except from an investor's perspective, you know, it means that the high net worth, the family office money, et cetera, can, can become a lot more prevalent because, that typical, you know, pre-seed or seed money that would be going into companies can move to profitability a lot faster, which is super exciting for the space. And, you know, the, I won't spend too much time on this, but I, one of my favorite uh, presentations was again by Peter Diamandis, where he talked about the move to ex the exponential organization. Right now, there's a few key factors in that, but there's two two things that I think is really important to actually three areas I want to really focus on is. Number one, the agile resourcing. We're noticing a lot more companies that sort of really aligned with the outsourcing aspect where instead of hiring a person so that they've got someone internal that may be at sort of 25 or 30% capacity, they're only sort of outsourcing or doing specific job functions as required when they need it, right? And that's really interesting. Then the API economy. Now, API you know, you think about it just from a purely software perspective, but actually you can see a lot of companies that are working out ways to actually connect with other organizations whether and create sort of other financial opportunities for their partners or for people in their ecosystem as well. And that's super interesting to see. So more strategic opportunities between companies, which, you know, is, you know, effectively aligned with that API economy. And then the global ecosystem, where it said there really is no limits to the capacity of what people can grow. We said it improved from a, a software perspective, uh, communication, logistics, et cetera. It said there's a global opportunity for the majority of companies. So this is, you know, to me, sets the foundation for what's exciting about what comes next. From a venture trends perspective, um, you know, this is already in motion. <laughs> this is almost stating the obvious at this point. Um, but the Bitcoin halving, uh, ETFs been approved and platform access has you know, made a big change with the, the digital asset bull run. So I said that's well entrenched. The increased desire for secondaries has been talked about a lot. I believe this area of syndication of opportunities will become a lot more prominent. Uh, increased fundraising with lower valuations. This is still taking place, right? So unfortunately for a lot of founders, they haven't realized that the, the good old days of 2021 are long, long gone. Um, but yeah, there's no down rounds that have become, you know, very much accepted because effectively the, the sort of not doing that either puts the company at risk or just creates incredibly lengthened capital raising timeframes. The opening of the IPO market in the second half, you know, this is from some of the guidance we've been talking with our group, good friends at the, the ASX. Effectively, they're expecting that it will open in the second half and, you know, on the digital asset bull run, obviously the Bitcoin halving takes place in two weeks. You know, it, there's some great uh, accounts that you can follow on Twitter or X uh, for that. But, you know, follow said follow some some really good people. One of my favorites, I love following Ben Simpson. Uh, he's really good to follow. I love following Henrik from Apollo uh, Capital. And there's several others in this area, but just people that give so solid information that's timely. I said, this is going to move super fast. You know, if you combine crypto and AI, 
I said, this space will move very, very fast. The ETF approvals, absolutely pumped to see Hong Kong uh, approved an Ethereum ETF uh, yesterday, which was uh, really well done from them. Congrats to the uh, OSL team uh, and Dave Chapman. You know, for, I imagine they've they've done a fair amount of work behind the scenes uh, for that. I don't can't remember the name of the the actual group that got it approved, but I know they're in behind it. And you can see uh, companies like Monochrome is an old client. Both of those sort of old comp companies that uh, WI worked with, but seeing Monochrome also working towards an ETF in Australia as well. So that's also exciting. But ultimately, the global platform platform access is a big one. You know, if anyone's tried buying, you know, any sort of substantial amount of crypto over you know, like a 10K amount, you know how difficult it is. Like banks freeze your account, they put fraud squads onto you, um, you know, as far as to, to follow it up. Um, they block you from doing transactions. They make they shut down accounts. This is all still happening in 2024 when it comes to crypto. And it's obviously very, very frustrating. So the ability to actually just go and buy a Bitcoin ETF through your Comsec account is an absolute game changer. And there's no limits to it. You know, if you actually think about it, the only way that to get six figure, the only way to easily get six figure exposure, you know, to crypto in, you know, is to either, you know, through some sort of uh, OTC, you know, market, you know, through OTC sort of thing like a uh, like an OSL, for example. Um, or going through um, fund managers or basically buying as an ETF. Like it's really hard to get your hands on six-figure uh, amounts of crypto, but now it's absolutely possible. So we will see millions and billions and we're already seeing billions of dollars flow into these ETFs. Um, so the key areas of uh, interest will be obviously DeFi, NFTs, more for the following next one, the, the tokenization of real-world assets, which is the RWAs. And the central bank uh, digital currencies is obviously becoming more popular, and stable coins are obviously becoming making their uh, sort of getting getting more and more attention. You know, so it's going to be interesting to see a lot of the innovation in this space. But as sort of you know, the more and more money moves online, it's very logical that crypto itself will start to really outpace the growth of what was uh, the growth of the when you look at the growth of the internet. You're now start. You're now seeing crypto really outpace that growth. So the onboarding, this will probably be the biggest mass adoption of people coming into the crypto space over the next 12 to 18 months as it goes through this bull run, which is very exciting. Uh, and then Kathy Wood, you know, said, and they've got a, a full research paper on this. You know, that she predicts that Bitcoin will reach a million dollars per coin by 2030. And if you think about where we're at right now, it's still super early. And so, you know, it's very interesting for me when people like her that I highly respect are making comments about where Bitcoin is going. So sector trends, I, as I've just put this in Australia, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, said this, I'm going to make this available for everyone. But, you know, these are all fairly obvious and things that we've been seeing over and over again um, in the last sort of 12 months. And it's going to continue for this next 12 months as well. What's interesting for me is the area of uh, ESG seems to have gone completely off the radar. You know, once BlackRock uh, sort of come out and said they're going to stop coin using that term, you know, it really hasn't been mentioned since August. It's barely been mentioned at all, but there's still a focus on the, and and, and now it's being rebranded to energy transition. Um, but anything sort of climate tech related or sustainability related or, you know, energy transition related is still of strong interest from an investor's perspective. Uh, Cyber security is one of those ones where it sort of doesn't really get in the media, but there's significant investment going into the space. Um, when I say covering the media, issues with cybersecurity get covered, but not the investments going into it and a lot of solutions. But there's some great stuff that's coming out. And obviously, it's come to basically go against anything like a breakthrough like AI or in the future, quantum computing, et cetera. You're going to see solutions coming out to, to basically solve that. Um, and then all these other ones, you know, we're also seeing still strong interest in from an investor perspective. One I want to, you know, play more of a role in is obviously space and aerospace technology. Unfortunately, there isn't that many companies uh, in Australia uh, that we've come across. We'd love to come across them globally as well uh, coming out. So challenges ahead, you know, just for these last five minutes. Basically, it's still going to be a challenging fundraising environment. You know, I don't know anyone that's come out and said capital raising is so much easier now. Um, so it's still a fun, so it's still a challenge, but that will increase the M and A interest as an alternative. There's a lot of M and A opportunities going on with sort of smaller software companies that instead of actually raising their next round, they're actually seeking to be acquired. Uh, there will be downward pressure on software prices, effectively 
software is actually just being commoditized all over the place. And, you know, I say this to a lot of new companies coming out. It's one of my biggest fears for them is that, you know, effectively it is much easier now for people to build software instead of having 10 people on the build team that they would have required millions of dollars to fund beforehand. They can do it with two or three and they can be a lot more agile uh, with code bases that are a lot more adaptive to AI, et cetera. So, you know, this is a super interesting thing that will, will play out. And I, one of the things you think about some of the unicorns that also could be potentially disrupted by this, like the area for me that I always like to reference is note-taking software. That was such a niche and unique area, you know, four years ago when COVID was coming on, you saw it explode, unicorns created, and now it's just been everywhere, like everyone's doing it. Then you've got things like event software, you know, for example, you had the likes of, um, what was that? There was a company uh in the uk where they raised you know they became a unicorn you know during COVID, and they've just sold their remaining assets for you know something like 10 to 20 million dollars right so the commoditization of software companies is going to be something super interesting and this last one if businesses haven't changed their models basically the rising customer acquisition costs because the the, the salaries of their marketing and sales departments haven't changed that much uh marketing maybe a little bit but effectively and then also there's been email change rules by yahoo and google that are really going to increase our customer acquisition costs so you know like i said companies will be looking for more proactive ways uh to create it you related opportunities as i said non-bank lending is one of the biggest for us you know i we see so much money coming into our clients that are in these areas you know it's just a great time to get access to yield if you're an investor you know and these are the different areas that you can actually go in to do that and you know, for a lot of investors that may have actually cashed out or made some significant money from their portfolio up to sort of like 20, 21, you know, maybe early 22, et cetera, you know, they're just seeing their thing. How can I beat these returns when I can get returns and have them sort of backed by assets, you know, and I can be getting returns between 10 and 18% per year. That becomes very, very appealing. So we were seeing a lot more focus in yield related opportunities. For me, in the final minute, what I'm excited about is if you bring that all together, Effectively, the role that AI, software, and platform technologies will play. I said, I love watching innovation roll out. It's a beautiful thing when you can see it and you know what's happening, but and you just watch how it actually navigates all the different problems that goes along with it. The Bitcoin halving, it's very rare that you have an investment opportunity where its growth is literally written into the code. And that's effectively the Bitcoin halving. You know, we've been talking as a company. You know, we've been really encouraging our investors, our subscribers to put attention on Bitcoin going back to sort of July last year, knowing that this event in the next two weeks is coming up. The S-curve adoption, uh, S-curve technology adoption said all technology follows this S-curve adoption, right? All those platform technologies are actually going through their early adopter or early majority phase, which is where most of the value actually gets created. So it is super exciting. And then you're seeing rights law. The cost of man the cost of actually building things and manufacturing things is just coming down exponentially. Whether it be from solar panels, whether it be from training AI, whether it be from you know sequencing genomes, etc. All of it's coming down at an escalating price. So you know it creates more upside financial opportunity. And then the last one that's playing the biggest role is just simply network effect. You know we're all you can get access to absolutely anyone, nearly anyone and everyone right now whether if you're a social media if you're a b2c business the social media platforms give you access to billions of people and if you're a b2b business the the data the data platforms give you access to millions of different whoever you want to target you can literally find their details so and then you can organize sort of scaled outreach to them so us in 2024 we did our rebrand did a launch of capital hq incredibly pumped with that you know, this really sets our definition for us. You know, we're positioning ourselves as a private capital marketplace. Um, so you'll see that we'll not only have venture opportunities, but private equity, business sale opportunities, credit related opportunities, digital asset, et cetera. You know, effectively, we are a home for investors to access all different types of opportunities uh, that they wish to on our platform in the private market space. And that's the space that we own really well. Um, and everything we think about is how we can actually just simplify engagement to that. You know, so for, for investors, I said, we streamline and simplify as a process for them. For founders, we also simplify, simplify and streamline their process for their own raise. And we also provide different flexible options uh, for them as well. One of the things we're building right now is basically the instant deal room creation, where basically a company can give us a certain set of material. 
uh, that they typically already have. And then within, you know, within seconds, they can have their deal room created. Everything we think about is how we can actually save founders time in the process of raising capital. So that is it from me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the Capital HQ Investment Showcase. I said, this is the first of many. You know, as much as I love, I obviously love the in-person experience and we've built our name doing that. These online showcases are going to play a valuable role for us going forward because whilst you don't get the same, get to feel the same buzz and connection of an energy, for us, it's all about creating more visibility and more awareness about the people, the investors, the companies, the opportunities, et cetera, that are in this space that are doing great work. So in an ideal world, we want to be hosting this every two months. Um, and then we obviously want to be inviting a global audience to actually attend our event. So I hope you enjoyed the Capital HQ Investment Showcase, and I look forward to seeing you at our next one.